Welcome everybody. Just getting just getting loaded up. We're just getting started. It's good to see all of you. Um gonna have another fun fun stream tonight, make up for not being able to, to do one yesterday. Um we're gonna look at some more advanced um Yeah. We're gonna yeah, we're gonna look at some more advanced scripting. Uh we're gonna do some easy requests to kind of get started and get into the groove of things. We're gonna look at an end back task that's uh it was it was it was a good one. It was very important to, to kinda of do, I think, because a lot of people were very interested in it. I'm just moving my mic and just checking my levels. Um But yeah. Welcome everybody. So uh let me start let me move on to sharing my screen. So, where are we going to start today? So, for people that are new to the stream, for people that are, might not be familiar, this is a psychology research methods, data analysis kind of stream. Um, the first few, I guess you'd call them episodes, <laughs> uh, are about Gorilla, which is an online experimental platform for collecting data. I will be covering other things in the future, such as uh, Psychopie. Uh, might take a look at Inquisits and other kind of platforms like uh, Qualtrics, um, using things like JS Psych. We'll talk about different research methods, different kinds of data visualization. We'll dip a little bit in and out of R. Um, we're going to do a lot of things, basically. So, yeah, if, <laughs> hopefully as, as we go along, we'll find something that people might like to do. And that might be helpful for them to try and get their very research to transition online, as well as to build better, more complex, um, more uh, well kind of put together experiments. So that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help, here to you know, try and do what I can. We're not just going to be exploring Gorilla, we're going to be exploring all sorts of things in future streams, Psychopy, data visualization, all sorts of cool stuff. But for now, we're going to be doing uh, some Gorilla community requests again. So we're going to be doing some scripting in Gorilla. We're going to look at a couple of easier ones just to get warmed up a little bit, just to see, you know, go over some of the basics again. Um, hey, good evening to um, Samantha as well. Nice to see you. Um, I'm going to do some some uh, of the more simpler requests first, and we're going to get into this uh, bigger end back task. I'm also going to talk about destroying and recreating zones and stuff like that. So hopefully, you know, people do watch these streams back, even if they don't watch live. So hopefully people will find it useful. Um, and it's good to kind of get your feet wet a little bit in terms of scripting and things like that, because it'll allow you to do, you know, more complex, more robust, more valid kind of experiments. And it allows you to go past beyond with any of the platforms like Gorilla or Psychopy or Qualtrics or all that kind of stuff can give you. It's always good to know how far you can push technology. Always happy to chat about research methods, um, data, literally anything psychology related. So, you know, just throw things at me um, or hopefully people can join in future streams as well if you've got questions. So let's get started. I'm gonna, I've got a bunch of requests that I've taken from the Gorilla Facebook group that I used in the previous stream as well. And we're going to get started, first of all, with a couple of kind of warm up ones to try get us into the groove. Um, a little bit. So one of the first things I'm going to look at is this Stroop attention uh, checks one. So for people that are new and might not have seen me do this before, what I do is I'm just grabbing um, what I do before I've done. This is my third stream. So it's, it's not like it's an established precedent. Um, <laughs> it's what, you know, things will change over time. You know, uh, as we're doing this, you know, when we do different kind of experimental platforms, we do scripting, things are going to get messy. We're not going to get the right answer the first time around. And that's OK. And understanding how we figure out and how we get to the answer is just as important as getting the answer. And in kind of today's world where everyone wants everything immediately, uh, it's not, <laughs> and not being able to learn how to get to the answer um, and then being able to transfer that skill to find other answers and be able to support yourself in the future. So you're not reliant on someone like me, for example. Uh, that is really good because it helps you and um, prepare you, especially when people go off and, you know, do uh, big projects where they do big um, kind of funded academic projects. If they don't have the skills to support themselves, they don't have to, you know, waste money and waste time um, by picking up people that for consultancy or that kind of work. Although, you know, if you work with an experienced developer, that's always good as well. 
But if you could support yourself, then you can even ask better questions from your developers. So if you want to do something like make a mobile application or an online platform or something, and you're doing that for a research project, you know, being able to ask the correct technical questions is also important as well. So a little bit of knowledge, always useful. So this first one, so let me zoom in a bit. So this first request, I've taken the names off all of them. So I do add them to my open materials, but this first one is I'm asking for attention checks, attention checks, and my apologies, for a Stroop task. And they basically are asking for pressing space for the correct response and having multiple incorrect responses. There's a hook for this, and it's going to be a fairly simple example. Um, you can uh, kind of finagle it through through Task Builder, but um, I wouldn't recommend it. Basically, um, if you want to if you want to mark things as correct or incorrect, just a couple of lines of script here will will help. So hopefully this is an easy one to kind of do. So I'm just going to set this as kind of in development for myself, so I know, and then I kind of just tick them off as I go. So Gorilla has a bunch of really useful, really amazing. Let me just zoom in a bit. Uh, Gorilla has a bunch of really good kind of samples to get started with. So like I said, we're just doing this one as a, as a bit of a warm up. So um, if we go to the Stroop task, they already have a pre-made Stroop task. It has uh, a bunch of practice trials, a bunch of regular trials. It's got answers in, and I believe it has two keys in. It has, yep, two keyboard responses. Um, Q and W. This person's using P and Q, so I'm gonna um, uh, swap the swap them to P and Q just to make the example a bit more kosher and lined up for them, um, so that everything is kind of in line. Um, and I'm gonna press P and Q here, uh, and then I'm gonna swap it to space for some attention checks. Now they haven't said. Uh, and I posted about this and asked them um, what they wanted to do in terms of like uh, lining up. Um, the space inside a block or different blocks they haven't said so i'm just going to make an assumption that it's going to happen inside a second block and then hopefully they can extrapolate from there uh sorry my light just went off there for a second that was a that was a wicked interruption <laughs> all right it's back now yeah i can turn this i can turn this light off that's the that's kind of my face here um yeah it's uh it's sometimes the power cuts out for a little bit so not having not having the best weekend couldn't get the stream on yesterday uh, it was just, <laughs> internet was terrible day, lights cutting out, everything's happening. It's all right. Everything's a little bit messy. It happens. So, um, what we want to do is first of all, we want to clone this Stroop task, right? So we've, they've got the, they've got the Stroop task for us. Um, I'm going to add it to my, uh, open materials. So we're going to call this, uh, Stroop task with attention checks. Now there are attention check scripts that are already made by Gorilla. Um, a lot of those are a bit too advanced for, for this, basically. So this should be a lot simpler. Um, I'm just going to swap the P and Q here. So well, we have, let's do, yeah, let's do Q on the left-hand side and then P on the right-hand side. So the second one, there we go. doesn't really matter. Uh, and then for, yeah, let's do these two um because uh, these are multiple keyboard zones uh i might change these to to single ones because the the person here has indicated uh p and q just for, for responses so let's just change these zones quickly first so we're going to go to single responses not ideal because this has four four colors so we're also going to re reduce the colors to, to two colors um but this is just to to kind of get us uh started and think it in, in kind of script mode. So if P is, if let's do Q is pressed, record it as Q. And if P is pressed, record it as P. So these will be the um, ones where we're going to have um, no attention checks because this is going to be in the practice trials. What I'm going to do is for the actual trials, I'm going to introduce uh, the space bar as well. So let me just make these single responses as well. Um, or I could I could make one a multi and one a, one a single response. It doesn't really matter, like both of them uh, work. The, the logic's the same. Um, yeah, for the sake of having the sake of having fewer zones, let's let's have one as 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 the multi. Um, and let's have one as the single one. So 
Uh, okay. Scroll down. So Q is pressed. Let's record it as Q. If P is pressed, let's record it as P. And then let's put space in for this single zone. So, like I said, hopefully fairly easy. What we're going to be using is we're going to be using a hook known as um, is correct, basically. So these keyboard response zones, just to kind of get us warmed up, they kind of have these active response um, settings, basically. So when you press them, they will have, uh, they will be marked uh, kind of correct or incorrect. Now you can do this without scripting, really, because you could just have um, the answer being, you know, space basically for that. And if it's not space, then uh, you could have it go P and Q. But I'm just going to use an is correct hook just to show you because it's really, it's not too, it's not too difficult basically. So what we're going to do is we're going to, and I will reduce the the number of colors as well. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just download the spreadsheet quickly just to, just to do that. So there's, yeah, there's two ways to do this. You can do this in the task builder without any scripting, but scripting is also also very easy. So let's just set enable editing to on here. Let me just, let me zoom in for a second. So let me just change these to all to Q, make everything really simple. Now, if you had, um, I'm aware I can copy the, the formula now. <laughs> um, now, if you had, uh, let's say we have another, block of trials. So let's just copy the rows. Right, so this is our second lot of trials here. So let's assume in here we have some checks that are spaced basically. So If you have it set up like this, um, when they obviously press Q, Gorilla will mark it as correct. Um, when it gets to the space, Gorilla will mark it as correct. Um, and if they press anything that's not space, Gorilla will mark it as incorrect. So I'll just, I'll show you how that works first before I just do the literal two lines of code. Um, but let's just upload this spreadsheet to choose file. There we go. So if we now preview this, just to have a look at the data really quickly. Um, I haven't changed the instructions. Sure. So we've got, well, this is correct. So three out of three, correct. Spare space. I'm just pressing space now all the way through. So yeah, it should record for the ones where we put space, it should record that as correct. And then for the ones where, yeah, so you got seven correct. And that should match up with the the ones here. So yeah, we've got these. Uh, and I think I accidentally pressed Q for the first three. So uh, let me have a look at my, let me have a look at my responses just really quickly. Um, so this one is technically solvable without any kind of scripting. Um, so if we have a look at my my responses, so we've got obviously, um, you've got your fixation, you've got your presentations. So yeah, we've got the practice ones all correct. Then my first responses were yeah, Q, 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 and then space all the way through. And then obviously there's only a couple that were correct for space, so. Um, you can see here, you know, Gorilla's marking one as correct, and it's marking the next one as incorrect. That one's actually obviously the fixation screen, so obviously there's no correct response for that. So like this, this kind of stuff is in that sense for analyzing our Stroop data if we were to go that far, that would be kind of meaningless basically. Um, but we can also do this, and this is just a little bit of a warm up with code. So when I share this, I'm going to share with the person who asked about the attention check checks. I'm going to share this version, basically not the excuse me. Not the uh, code one, but the code one's quite simple as well. So 
Um, I just want to talk a little bit about hooks again, just to kind of get us thinking about hooks, because we're going to use it for the end back task. Basically, it's important that we that we think and understand where hooks kind of come in. So if I go to hooks, so I always recommend people go to the hooks page, have a look and understand what's happening. So hooks are fired when Gorilla's completed or looked at in a certain thing. So for example, there's an is correct one. So when you mark a response as correct or incorrect, any code that you put in place that is correct will be executed when response is given or processed on screen. So when we're doing this, um, and this is being done, um, and we're processing, sorry, let me go to the, to the screen here. So when you're pressing your buttons and your keyboards to respond, the hook's going to be fired when Gorilla's looking at these responses to see if they're correct or incorrect. And it does that generally, obviously, when it's logging the response time. So there's basically, we're going to talk a little bit about events later, but when you press a keyboard, there's like an event that can be detected, an event that's available, uh, an event that's kind of known, um, or can be known or can be collected by the browser. So in this case, Gorilla will know when these, like a key has been pressed and obviously can use that to mark it as correct or incorrect using the answer. But this is like a really kind of simple example for how this hook might work. So if I just go here, um, you'll see that the thing that goes into the actual hook itself, so this is the hook. So basically it's just a function that's running. It gets past all of these parameters. So just to recap for people, when you run a hook, um, all of these objects are going to be available to you. So, you know, the spreadsheet you're using, the row index that you're on, the screen index you're on, the row that you're on in your spreadsheet, what the response is, that's the important one for us, what the zone name is and what the zone type is. So we can check for particular zone types or um, names if, if we wanted to. So I'm just going to copy this. So um, if I wanted to mark multiple things as correct or incorrect, um, the first thing I'd want to do is... Like with any of the hooks, I want to define to make sure that we're on the right kind of page to make sure we're checking for the right thing. So we don't want to be checking for anything pressed here, here, or here, or here, or here. So what we want to do is we want to focus on this trials display. So if we look at the spreadsheet, you notice we've got all these columns like randomized blocks, randomized trials displays, and all that. Now in the hook, you notice we get past the spreadsheet itself as well as the row from that spreadsheet. Now we can use that to kind of check against when we do hooks. So again, this is just a really simple intro. So if I just do, this is an if statement. So an if is basically just a conditional. Um, and what happens in JavaScript is, or TypeScript, um, you know, because you can use either in this compiler. What happens in here is basically you put if, uh, and it's just going to check for something to like, see if a conditional has been met, like a threshold or whatever has been met. So what we want to see first is if we're in the right display. So if we want to make sure we're on the section where we're meant to be. So we're going to do if row, and then we're going to use dot display, and then we're going to do trials. Now, what does this mean? So the row is an object that's passed to us. Um, and actually, if you do a console log on the row, you can see um, the row object itself and see all the properties that are passed to you. Now, one of the things that's passed to you is all of the columns like these as kind of uh, properties that you can access by just doing the dot display. So when you have an object in JavaScript, so if I just zoom in a bit more and um, make, make the code a bit easier to read. If you have an object in, in um, JavaScript, you can do like object and then you do the dot and then that allows you to call um, a property. So you can call a property like that um, or you can call a function. You can call it like that um, where you use the, the brackets for a function basically. So um, in this case, we're looking for row dot display. We want to make sure we're on the trials page. Now, really simply, I always just do if you're new to to um, if you're new to uh, kind of the JavaScript debugging, anything stuff like that, you could always use console log statements, and I'm going to use them in the end back task when putting it together later, just to show you. But basically, console log statements themselves um, allow you to put uh, you know any number of things in um that you can then see in the console which comes up while you're running your task so you know i always use i always i always use that as well so i'm going to be using that a little bit in a second but after we're on trials the next thing i want to check is are we on the screen where we have to press buttons so we don't want to check for a response here because this this screen is basically useless for like from the perspective of our code it's useful in our task in our experiment but we don't need it because it doesn't tell us anything in terms of like the correct response. So this person wanted to know if they could label multiple things as correct or incorrect. So just looking at that, 
Um, this is the screen that we want. Now you notice it says screen two, and you can obviously rename these screens, so you can rename them to, to whatever you want. Um, you can access them by the screen name. It's a bit tricky and finagly. The easier thing to do is access them by the screen index property. So if we do if screen index is equal to one, what this is going to do is it's going to check to see if our screen index is on the second page, basically. Now, why is screen index equal to one equal to our kind of screen two in there? Because JavaScript is one of those zero index languages. Now, what that means in simple terms is this would be your screen zero and this would be your screen one. Similarly here, screen zero, screen one. So we want to check on, um, we want to check on our, uh, let me just get a reload the script page. There we go. Um, let me zoom out a bit and then reload this page. Sometimes the script editor gets a bit funny about sizing and everything. Um, <laughs> excuse me. You can add, uh, you can add more lines and then allow yourself to, to scroll, obviously. Um, but I didn't want to add anything else here. So, uh, so if we're on the second page, um, what we want to do is check the response, but we only want to check the response when the correct response should be space. So there's a bit in the spreadsheet, obviously called answer. And we've got space here. So what we can do is row dot answer. Um, and then that will give us the property for that object for row, where we can check against it. So if we wanted to do something like if row dot answer capital, it's important that we get the casing right, it goes to space, then do this. Now you'll notice when I've been entering text, like trials and space, I've put it in commas. So again, for people that are new to, to kind of scripting, the, uh, these kind of single quotes, um, not commas, sorry, these single quotes, are for uh, signifying that this is text that we're checking against, not like a straight number or integer, like the screen index, basically. And data types are important because you want to check against the correct data type. If you watch my last stream from, my first stream actually, so if you watch my first stream from Saturday, from literally a week ago, I was trying to, to do a division, uh, sorry, my second stream actually, I was trying to do a division on string and you can't carry out a numerical division on string data, you have to carry it out on uh, obviously numerical or integer kind of data. So, you know, you can, even more experienced people can can mess up. It's always important to know, you know, um, uh, what you're doing and what you're looking for and what data types you have. So um, now we've got this set up. So when we're on trials, when we're on the second screen, when this is space, what we can do is we can look at what response they give. Um, by the way, the reason I'm tabbing in, so the reason I'm tabbing in for each of these is because this is a conditional. So obviously, if this is true, this is checked. If this is true, this is checked. If it's not, then it just ignores the next bit of code, basically. And that kind of indent signifies like the, it's good visually, um, it signifies it for you. Now, in some languages and some compilers, actually the indent is actually needed as well. So certain languages have particular rules when you're writing code where the indents are actually necessary to compile the code. In JavaScript, that's not true. Um, I don't think it's true for TypeScript either or this compiler specifically. Um, you can you could you could do the code like this. It still still would execute. But it's nicer looking at it like this way so you can tell kind of hierarchically what's going on. So the next thing we want to check is response. So if response and remember response is an, uh, is something that we get passed because it's a uh, you can tell you can tell what things are objects and what things are data. By the way, uh, well, an object is is kind of data put together. But um, if response, for example, is passed to us as a string, row is passed to us as any. So you know that's uh, that's how you can tell kind of what's coming in. So if response is equal to space, then what we can do is mark it as correct. Now, if you go back to the hook to mark something as correct, we basically return new correct as true. So we can do this, just set it to true, and then it'll be marked correct. Now, Gorilla already will do this for us because we've already asked it to in this section down here, um, basically. So it will already do this for us. So I'm just doing this as kind of like a like a bit of a warm up, bit of a practice to try and get people used to, to how we're using hooks and using an easier example. 
um, because these are perfect to try and explain, even though they can be done in the task builder. Um, so what we, what we can do with an if statement is you can do else. So if you do else, that means that basically anything else that comes in, it could, will be then, you know, something else will happen. Um, now you can do else ifs as well, or you can do multiple if statements. But say you wanted to say if response was equal to, and then we could check to say if it's equal to Q or if it's equal to um, P, then return, and then we return this new correct, but we return it with false. So that's that's kind of like, uh, it's gonna set up the correct kind of incorrect responses for us. Now, responses can also, for example, time out. Now, when responses are timing out, Gorilla doesn't necessarily run the is correct hook. Uh, I don't think from from my my especially my excuse me especially from my end back examples earlier. So Gorilla doesn't necessarily run the is correct um, to check for timeout responses. That does show up though in the screen finish. So in the screen finish. Um, sorry, screen redirect, that's the one. So yes, on screen redirect, the timeout does show up so you can see if it has timed out and you can see in response if it is timed out as well. So so yeah, you can use that, um, the screen redirect or the screen uh, finish ones to check uh, as well. But in the uh, responses here, obviously we put if response equals space, if response equals Q. Now we can't really set anything for timed out on here. So we'd have to use another another hook basically. But this kind of does the same thing as this down here. So it's not super necessary for us to do it, but it's just a good, um, it's just a good example. I'll share this with the, the person who asked uh, earlier for the attention checks, uh, but I'll share the, the non-script version. So um, that's all right. That's one that's, that's kind of, uh, that's very easy to, to do. So let's just do another quick one and then get into the end back task. So let's do, let's do one that's, that's going to be easy. So if we do the five levels of difficulty. So this person was asking for um, presenting words. So they were presenting words where they're going to get um, people to rate their confidence on them. So I'm just going to put this together really quickly. Um, they want uh, 10 words. So five levels has 10 words presented, five separate trials after which a sort of rating score is calculated. If more than 50% of the words are rated at two or lower, I'd like it to simply move on to the next task within the experiment and record the participants' ratings and levels where they stopped. So um, you can finish a task and you can finish, um, you can force Gorilla to advance to the next screen and you can finish a task early. So this this is actually a bit of scripting that we can use um, and they're provided with a Leica or slider scale to rate their confidence. So we're gonna use um, for the benefit of making this a bit easier. We can use an active zone. So we're going to use an active like a one, or we can use a, we could use a slider as well. Um, both lead to, both lead to the same place. Basically. Uh, I'll use a, I'll use a slider scale because we're going to make a slider later in the stream. We're going to make a vertical slider. So it's easier if we talk about sliders then now. So let's just go. So it's going to make a new task. Five levels of word. Difficulty, confidence of ratings. I'm putting uh, everything together onto my open materials page. It's actually kind of long. <laughs> I, when I go to, hold on, I'll show you. If I just go to inspect for a second, uh, if I go to the console, when I open up my open materials page, I don't want to break it up because it takes forever, but you can see that it takes a while to load up. There's 255 kind of uh violations of listeners so it takes a while and whenever i press edit and try and add something it does take a while to to add unfortunately um well let's get back to this so uh yeah it's just because i put too much onto one page um i should have started separating them out but the examples weren't coming in in like a nice order so people were like giving me random things like css questions or stuff like that so i didn't have any kind of preconceived notions of, of categories so uh, let's look at this word confidence one, and then we'll launch into the end back one and to the, um, the slider one. So let's just make something called task. Um, I'm going to move this mic a little bit, just so I keep uh, almost hitting it with my, my head there. 
Um, so let's just make uh, one called task. So I'm just gonna, first thing I'm gonna do is just have something that presents the word on screen. So um, we're gonna have a rich text zone, don't need all this. And then we're gonna run uh, the words from a word column. So let's just call it stimuli words. Obviously, you know that when you make a, uh, when you set the source on Gorilla to be from a spreadsheet, you know that it will automatically add it to the spreadsheet that's setting up for you. Now, he's saying he wanted, and this particular requester wanted five levels of difficulty and wanted 10 words in each one. I'm just gonna use some some random words, basically. And, and I'm gonna use the, the console log on this one as well, so that's why I've got this this open. So because we're gonna start using this for debugging in the, the end back task as well. So we're gonna get into that a little bit. So. Where should we start? Well, first thing is if I press preview task, go create spreadsheet, it'll create a spreadsheet for me. And there's nothing on here at the moment, so I'll just finish. So, um, first thing I wanna do now the spreadsheet is made before I do all the trials quickly is just add a like, uh, we're gonna do scales. Let's yeah, let's do uh, sliders, sorry. We're gonna do sliders. We're gonna give the, so it's always good to, name your zone. So if I go to here, so it's good to name your zone. So Gorilla gives your zones like random names. It's good to give them names that you can then use for scripting um, if you're going to be doing scripting. So I'm going to call this word zone one, just in case we want to do anything to it. And I'm going to call this one because obviously it was an advancement zone. We're going to call this one slider zone one. That's going to make it easy to kind of refer to. Uh, obviously, we can set up the uh, slider zone to um, require response. You can set up to, to collect multiple ones if you wanted to, but in this case, we're just going to want to use it to collect the confidence ratings of people. So I go to edit layout. What I'm going to do as well is so the person can get to the next page is I'm going to put a continue button, um, which I could have just left as the original one and <laughs> added the slider in afterwards. Well, I'm going to put the continue button in um to go to the next page basically so that people can uh go on to uh after they've given their slider ratings so now that we've done that um slider zone one all right it's not showing the 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 mapping but that is that is called slider zone one so i know that you know that's not showing up um so what do we want to do well uh, before we set up the spreadsheet I can already start thinking about collecting kind of the responses. So in this case, I'm going to use a different hook. So um, we're going to use uh, the on-screen finish. Um, so this is when the response has been kind of collected. Uh, we could also use the screen redirect as well. Uh, but let's use the let's use the on-screen finish. So this is this is when everything's kind of done. Um, we could use the redirect to make our make our lives a little bit easier, but the the finished one's going to be more useful. So in this one, we're going to check on the page that we're interested in for the slider, and we're going to get its value. So we're going to do the same thing we did last time. Going to be row dot display. You know, check for task. Uh, if anyone's got any questions about why I'm using the doubles equals sign, I kind of go over this a couple of times. But in programming, obviously, when you're using like a single equals sign, so if I was doing, you know, like display equals you're setting a variable. In this case, we use double equals, we're checking if it's equal to. There's also triple equals as well, which kind of means always equal to as well. Um, so that's why we use the double equals sign here. Uh, and earlier as well, you noticed I used the, the kind of double um, kind of straight lines. They're basically the logical equivalent of the word or. So if you wanted to do multiple conditionals, you could do something or something. You can do it using that. Um, the other one you can do is and as well. So you can have multiple things that have to be true for the code to execute. So in this case, if we're in display task, um, we're gonna do the screen index again. So we just wanna be on screen. This time we're gonna be on the first screen. Um, the little curly braces said before, but they signify the bits where the code's gonna be running after the, the if basically. So what we wanna do is we wanna collect up their kind of ratings. So how do we access something that we've given a zone name to? Well. Yeah, we're going to use a bit of jQuery. So jQuery is um, a library that's loaded in with Gorilla. 
it usually um, the functions and everything else starts by utilizing this kind of dollar sign um, and then in this case we can try look for the slider zone like this so why am I utilizing um, sorry why am I utilizing let me just zoom out a bit so why am I utilizing this kind of period slider zone one so when you're looking for something in jQuery there's different ways of selecting objects that appear on your screen so I'm just gonna make this a bit bigger here, um, just for a second, and then I'm going to move it back. So this in the uh, kind of inspect tab. So if I get rid of this for a second, if I go right click and I go inspect, this is Chrome's kind of dev tools. This shows you the breakdown of a page, everything that's on a page. Um, with things like network, you can watch what's being sent and loaded. So you can see the like the fonts that Gorilla's loading and the style sheet that it's loaded. Um, with performance, we can record what Gorilla, what like code Gorilla is running. So we'll be using that in a little bit. Um, with memory as well, you can do a bit of a profile and you can see what's kind of going on in the background. With console, obviously, we can see like, you know, any kind of output and you can write like direct JavaScript to console, right? So you could do like, if I wanted to type in like var, I wanted to do like number to test and I'll do equals 10. Um, you see it says undefined, but now if I call number to test, it's there and it shows me 10. So you can actually like interact with JavaScript on the page as well. Um, and you can use that for testing or moving things around in, in kind of uh, Gorilla. And I'll show you how in a second. So let me just, um, we're going to introduce you to, to doing kind of some, some live debugging to save us a bit on, on the writing of code here a little bit. Um, it's good because you can then play around and see the effects of your, your code in real time. And then you can then copy that to like a notepad or visual code file or whatever. Uh, and then visual studio code and then just stick it into, um, stick it into your gorilla script area. So, uh, if I go to, let's just, let's just put some actual words in. So let's just put 10 random words in. And after this one, we'll do the, we'll get onto the end back task basically. So let's just put some, some randomly generated words in. Um, we're just going to copy task down to, yeah, yeah, let's do to two levels. We'll randomize the first ones to, uh, there we go. And then let's just present, uh, Present the word angle um, for the first 10. And let's present the word beta for the second 10. So we've got 10 words and 10 words. Let's just upload the spreadsheet. I could pre prepare these things before time, but I kind of like doing them as I'm working because it kind of helps keep my brain fresh even doing the kind of more simple tasks, uh, kind of the, the grunt tasks, I suppose. Um, so we've got two sets of tasks. One is, you know, confidence in the first 10 words, the other's confidence in the next 10 words. Now, um, obviously we've got this slider that represents, you know, how confident you are. We could add, we could, we could flesh this example out a little bit more just quickly by just adding a bit of rich text, you know, to ask the question. We'll add a zone here. This would be rich text. And that'll be, please rate your confidence in this word. So uh, let me just turn on zone mapping because it makes it easier to see. So this is our slider zone one. So I'm going to show you how to access, um, how to use jQuery to access the slider zone. Um, but I'm also going to show you a little bit about how to use the console to do some kind of uh, live messing around in JavaScript. So I'm just going to go on preview. So now we've got the word up here. If I select inspect, that's our class there. You can see word zone one. Um, let me just make this a bit bigger. So on here on the side, on the right hand side, um, hopefully if you're watching in 720p of my internet, it's all right, you can kind of see it. But um, basically uh, you've got um, all the classes that are assigned to this and it's highlighted you can see in blue on screen so if i move over other things you can see all the different kind of gorilla zones that we can look for 
So we can search for this particular zone by the class name. So if I go to the console now, and I'm going to use that kind of jQuery notation that I was using earlier, so that kind of dollar sign one. Um, if I refer to, because uh, it's loaded into the web page for us, so if I refer to the slider zone one, like the Vans, um, and I, I'm going to make this, I'm going to call this var target slider. I do this to show you what happens. Target slider. So there's our, there's our slider. So this, this output here is basically all the bits that make up our target slider. So it's got three sections. It's actually, you can see it's highlighted to so see um, jQuery will already load this up. And when I click on it, I can go to the section that it is for our slider. So we can use the console to kind of mess around live, um, which is really useful because you can do things like, for example, um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but if I called like the CSS function and I wanted to change the width of the slider, let's say I wanted to do it 20%, um, you could do that. And see that, that affects it on screen. Now it's made this really tiny. Uh, so if I reload this page now, uh, let me make my screen a bit wider. You see it's back to normal and then we'll have lost the bit of like live JavaScript that we're doing. So let me just do var target slider equals, and we'll do dollar sign, we'll do the brackets, and in the there, we'll put in the period or the full stop, um, and then we'll do slider, uh, slider zone one, and then we'll do target slider dot CSS. Let's do something else. So let's make the width, I don't know, let's make it like 50% or something like that. Um, and then this way you can kind of play around and see like, live JavaScript and learn a little bit in terms of like how to interact with your, with your different elements. You can do the same thing with CSS. So if I move this a bit to the side here, you notice on the right hand side here, I've got this styles bit. So there's event listeners that like say, you know, what Gorilla's listening out for, and what the web page is listening out for. There's a bit about layout. There's some stuff about what the kind of border and padding computed CSS looks like. We can also edit styles on the go just to see like what you can do. So if I went on like the angle one and on the element size I did, let's do, uh, let's change the font size. So it's at the moment at 14 pixels, which is Gorilla's kind of largest default one. Let's set made this 50 pixels. There you go. And you can see that live and it's good because then you can play around and see what would happen if you change different CSS elements as well as changing different JavaScript elements. So it's a good way to kind of get, get into the habit of like, you know, playing around and getting used to um, how CSS and JavaScript work. Yeah, so that's a good question, Samantha. So yeah, would you then copy the width change to your script? Yeah, so obviously I wrote, um, so yeah, exactly. So I wrote like var target slider. So the first thing I did was obviously find my slider. So if I did if I did the slider zone one, so yeah, I just copy it in exactly like that. Um, and then I could do target slider dot CSS. And then you can do, you know, you can do your width 40% or whatever there. And you can do the same thing. Yeah. So once you know it works, you can just literally copy it and copy and paste it. Uh, and if something goes wrong, you can just reload the page. So that's, that's why I like it. It's good to, it's like the first time you're learning JavaScript, it's good because you can see it. And like CSS, you can see it live. Um, you can also edit the HTML. So it's not just the JavaScript and HTML. Uh, sorry, the JavaScript and CSS. You can edit the, the HTML as well. So if you wanted to change something when you're presenting it, you can also just literally click and edit. Um, and add stuff to it. And it's just good for messing around because then like, for example, um, just to use here. So this is the title of the task that Gorilla has. Um, if I had to change this, for example, there you go. Obviously this doesn't change anything on Gorilla's side. This is all client side. So this all happens just on your PC. As soon as I click reload on here, that'll disappear because that's not what the underlying web page is about. Um, that's how people um, do their screenshots where they pretend like they have millions in their PayPal accounts. <laughs> they just they just change them in the HTML to make it look like they do. <laughs> I'm sure some people are very rich, uh, but most people that do it on Twitter that I've seen have just <laughs> changed a bit of client side code. I managed to catch a cold in the pandemic. It's really weird. Um, it's probably because I've stayed inside quite a lot because. Um, because of my fiance's condition, I have to kind of like uh, isolate quite a lot. And obviously we have to shield and everything. So I managed to catch a cold. So I apologize for my, my coughs, basically. Um, 
So we'll get on to the end back task in a second. I'm just gonna just gonna finish this basically. So in terms of like adding up the responses, so that was that's what we we're gonna look at. Now um, the other thing I was gonna mention is this is really good for finding um, something called slider zone one. But the problem is is we have loads of slider zone one. So if if I'm just gonna show you what I mean. So if you try and find something by using the class, you're gonna pick up multiple iterations of it which is why we need to add a word called container, which I'll show you how it works in a second. But basically here in the slider zone, if I click on this, and I'm just gonna make the HTML a bit bigger. So in the HTML, we're in the first kind of look ahead frame. So this is something that Gorilla pre-roads with all of your data to make things a bit faster and everything else. Now it's not the only one. You can see it's preloaded the next few. So it's preloaded a couple more to get you to move on to the next trials a lot easier. Now, the thing is, is you can see that this is like the index of zero. This is an index of one. This is an index of two. As we move through it, it'll keep loading up these look ahead frames. Now, the problem is, is if we wanted to search for um, a slider, for example. So if you wanted to do var target slider, and in this case, I'm not going to use the class. I'm going to use the ID. So the ID is another way to refer to it. It's like a name tag. So rather than using um, the period slider zone. I'm going to use hashtag slider because that's the ID that it's given to it. If I select that and I go target slider, um, it gives me the, oh, sorry, I haven't put the, I forgot the, <laughs> forgot the dollar sign. See, this, this you know, thing will happen, happen live. Um, so if I now do target slider, you can see that there's actually three that are loaded. There's three sliders that are loaded up for us. That's because Gorilla has three of these look ahead frames loaded. Now, if we did something just to one slider, that would be fine. Um, but if you wanted to do it for all of them, you could do it this way by just referencing the ID or the class or, or whatever. Um, but usually you want to only affect the thing that's on screen right now, rather than stuff that might be on screen in the future. Because you might have like a correct response that works for this one, <laughs> but you might not have a correct response that works for the next one. And the slider here is really important because I don't want the value of the slider from like two frames ago. I want the slider from the current one. So how do we get to our current slider, to the current frame? Well, in JavaScript, you can you can go quite quite detailed when you select things. You can, when you add things kind of in left to right order in JavaScript, so assuming you're writing your code in English, of course. So what you can do is if you wanted to make it really complicated and you don't have to, but you could have a really kind of complex one where you go down the list of zones and classes and everything is. So you could have like um, gorilla, you could have like full size. Um, and each time you add another selector is basically narrowing down the list of things that it could be. Um, and you could select for like the first look ahead frame or something. So you could select for look ahead frame zero index, blah, blah, blah. That's really kind of tenuous and prone to error and difficult and Gorilla dynamically generates pages and all that. So it's not great. So Gorilla have added in something called container. So container, um, which you get passed is basically, and you can see here, the container is passed in the um, actual hook. So it's just passed as a string. So the container is basically that the frame that you're in, so in the look ahead frame that you're in. And this allows you to look at just the one that you're in now. Now, when you add the word container, um, if I did container plus slider zone one, what that would do is it basically put the word container. So put the value of container, the string that comes through, put that together and add on slider zone one. Now to find um, or select for another kind of CSS class, we don't want to find or select the one that's kind of like um, directly inside. So there's not going to be something called container slider zone one. So what we do is we have to put in a little space here to be able to select the class. So when you're doing like container select, and then you do the name of your class and then whatever you've got the zone named as, you should always have a space before the full stop or the period you select it. So now if I run this, you'll notice because I've done the, the width bit basically, um, what we can do is I can select, uh, so, oh yeah, sorry, one, one thing I did forget to say. So. Uh, we can't affect the slider, um, so this is on screen finish, so we'd set it on finish, so we'd only do it at the end, so we're not able to see the, the, the kind of width, width change. But what I want to do is I want to get the value from it. Now, how do we get the value? Well, one of the functions of slider is uh, val, so val gives you the value from that um, 
uh, slider basically at the end. So if I did something like var value to store, and then we did we did the target slider there, and then we did val like that, and then the brackets. That's like us calling a function on the target slider. And in this case, we're calling the val function to get the value back. Now, what I can do is to show you how this works. So I'm going to do a console log statement. So it puts it in. I'm going to put value to store here. And um, on my console, I'm just going to quickly turn on preserve log up here so that you can see it. Because without preserve log, this gets wiped page to page. So I'm going to turn on preserve log. I'm going to go to here. And then what I'm going to do is just going to make this a bit, a bit bigger. And I'm just going to clear this. So now when I press next, um, you can see that it's tried to store a value, but it's actually come out as nothing, basically. So this is this is the next thing that I'm showing. If I do this again, you'll see that it's it's come out this undefined, basically. So this is why it's important to think about um, you know where and when we're getting things from. Because uh, in this case, we're trying to get a value from Gorilla's slider zone, but we're not trying to get a value from its input. So let me show you what I mean. So if I if I go to the actual zone itself, and I right click on here, the zone is this bit up here that holds everything together, but it's not the thing that's got the value with it. So the value is actually an input that's used a little bit further down. It's an input type of text, and it's called slider, and that's what that's the thing that we're looking for. Now, there's two ways you can go about grabbing this. So rather than using the class, you could use container, and then you could use hashtag slider to get that. But that only works if you have one slider on the page, because they all have an ID of slider. So what I prefer to do is I prefer to use the class that we've given it, like slider zone one, to try and find it on screen. And then what I try and do is narrow my selection further. So rather than just the zone, what I want is I want to focus on the input element of the slider. So you can do input, and then you can do these kind of square brackets, and you can do type equals text. So what this will do is it'll select something that's in the container, that's got a class of slider zone one, and that's got an input of text. Now, if I run this now, so let's, let's go through this. Uh, let me go to the console, let me clear it. Now you see we're getting our value through. So let me set a different value. Let me set a different value. See that? So now we can actually get the sliders value and we can have multiple sliders on screen because we're not just using uh, the, yeah, because in the Gorilla scripting examples, they have the hashtag slider, which can call up multiple sliders. In this case, we can call up specific sliders if we're having multiple sliders. So this way we can reference a single slider um, there's a person on the forums who was asking about making sliders kind of pop out and how to select one slider out of many. This is kind of linked up to that. So I'm going to get onto the end back task now, but this would be kind of linked up to that. Um, just really quickly. So the last part of this request was, so, uh, the last part of this request was, you know, if they rated it two or lower to end the task early, if 50% of the words are rated two or lower. Um, so, uh, they say, we on to the next task in the experiment. Um, they didn't say if it's per trial or whatever, so I'm just going to do it at um, kind of block level, basically. So in our case, we've got... So let me just return to the configuration. So we've got 10 words. So we're just going to do uh, a bit of variable creation. So at the top of the screen... Um, sorry, at the top of the script builder... Um, I'm going to put in some global variables. So I talked about scope before, and scoping is, is important in scripting. So scope is basically where things can be accessed. So this variable here, value to store, for example, only exists inside this one if conditional. If I try to, uh, I don't know, go outside this conditional and check a value to store, like for example here, it would give me an error because it doesn't exist in that context. In this case, I want to make something that kind of permeates over several trials. I don't want to have to like restart it. I want to keep like a track of correct counts. And again, this like links into the NMAC task because we're going to keep track of the percentage correct. So what I'm going to say is, is we're going to do var, uh, and then we're going to do uh, rated high confidence. Uh, sorry, let's do let's do rated low confidence. So these are the this is kind of like. Um, Let's do, let's call it low confidence counter. 
It's always best to name your variables something that makes sense to you, but because I'm doing these examples for other people, I want to make it kind of as clear English uh, as possible because reading script is already hard for the first time. Um, and I always add in comments to help people obviously decipher what's going on. So the low confidence counter is going to be zero. Now, what I want to do is because we've got um, we've got 20 words, uh, I'm going to do, you know, 50%. If 50% of them are rated uh, two or lower, um, he didn't. Uh, so the requester didn't specify uh, whether or not he wanted per difficulty level or if he wanted it kind of individually. So I can either do it per like block basically or i can do it per um like the whole so for the whole thing so if i were to do it for the whole thing i could just kind of go over and uh, each time they rate it two or lower um i can set it to um i can set it, i can add another one to the counter basically and then if it reaches 50 percent, we can just finish and and end it there so if i wanted to do it per block what I could do is just keep track of the difficulty levels. Now, the person didn't really supply any logic for how many blocks they would need to stop. So, like, if after one block, someone rates it at, like, 43% confidence, and after two blocks, someone rates it at, like, 67% confidence, and it averages out to 50% confidence, like, is that going to trigger it? So, I'm going to do it over all the blocks together, but if the person then wants follow-up, I'll help them. So, if we do it, if we do it over the whole, like, block, basically... Um, so in this case, we want to know how many trials there are in total. So total total trials uh, is going to be 20 in this case. Um, we could programmatically grab it by going through and just grabbing the ones where randomized trial is here and then counting them programmatically, but it's much, much simpler just to, to give an actual value. Um, so in this case, we've got 20, 20 um, trials. And what we're going to do is each time, so if, and then we'll do uh, if value to store is less than, uh, less than or equal to two, um, we're going to add plus one to our low confidence counter. Um, you can do this a number of ways. You could just do like that, for example. Um, I always prefer just to make sure that we're re-referencing the variable to do that. Um, so each time someone says, okay, I value this less than two, I'm going to give plus one to our low confidence counter. Now I'm going to, uh, if I go to here, um, I'm going to set the slider value. So we're going to go from one to five. Let's do one to five. And then the minimum max will be half, uh, but we could always we could always do it to set it to a particular value. Um, we'll set require response on, so we'll do that. Um, and then that will log our low confidence counter. Now, because this variable is defined at a kind of global level, what this means is I can access this in multiple hooks. Now, the thing is, is when you make a variable global, don't forget like the last thing that you do to it might not be the thing that you think you're doing to it. So it's always important to keep a track of like what state your variable is in and to make sure that you reset variables as well if you're going to be using them. So if I was using the low confidence counter per like block, for example, I'd want to, and again, this is important for the end back one, you'd want to reset it basically. So we're going to do that in a moment. But in this case, we're going to have the low confidence to store uh, calculation here. Um, and then what we're going to do is if it reaches kind of like, 50% we want to finish and then move on. Um, so what we can do is on the screen finish, actually, um, what you can do is, uh, or actually we, might, we could do this on the, the screen redirect as well. So let me grab the other, uh, again, let me grab the other one, the screen redirect. Um, you know what, we'll do, we'll, do it on, we'll do it on screen finish. Let's just do it on screen finish. So you can get Gorilla to kind of force advance and end the task. So this is the one here, force advance. So it will force progression onto the next screen. You can also get Gorilla to, to just finish as well. So if you wanted to move on to another screen, you could use force advance. You can also uh, kind of just use finish um, and you can kind of end it there. Uh, but what I will do is I will, for this example, I'll finish this off stream, but I'll ask the person if they do want it per block. 
um, because it doesn't, in this sense, like even though they haven't responded to me, it doesn't make sense to do it over the whole thing because once you finish the whole thing, there's no point finishing the whole thing, if that makes sense. So I'm going to save this for now uh, and then I'm going to wait for that person to message me back um, and then I'll finish this uh, a little bit later once I get the view. So now I'm going to go on to the end back task, which is which is the big, big, big one. And I'm going to show you the completed one because this is like the what does it look like kind of thing um, when we finish, kind of like a kind of like a cooking show. <laughs> kind of, we're gonna look at and see what the final final product is like, um, and we're gonna do the require set, um, vertical slider as well. So that's gonna be the the next one, basically. So uh, let's let me just find the. Uh, let me just use control. Let me just use this and back. I have a lot of examples. Ah, so yeah, the console log version. So what we have, so for people unfamiliar with end back tasks, so what happens is they ask you to say if the stimuli was the same as you saw one, two, three trials ago, basically. So a one end back task would be presenting you, for example, with letters. And then what they might show you is they might show you um, like a series of letters. And then they might ask you, is this one that you're seeing right now the same as the one you saw one ago? Is this the same one you saw two ago, the same one you saw three ago? This normally is done with um, a spreadsheet where, so if you're using Gorilla or Psychopy, for example, where you have kind of a sorted level of um, uh, kind of stimuli and ordered stimuli, and you can kind of pseudo randomize it a little bit by just mixing different spreadsheets, and you can make it adaptive by using different spreadsheets. The problem is, is if you wanted to make it adaptive and kind of pseudo randomized, it can get a bit of a nightmare scenario, both with the code and with the experiment builder. So for the person that asked me for this, um, I built them something that's kind of an all-in-one solution. Now, the script for this is very complex, so we're going to go through it. But just to kind of show you, there's like a good few hundred, few hundred lines, basically. And this is the one where I've kind of broken it down a bit more so I can show you how everything works. But how do we go from kind of a blank slate to, to this, basically. Well, the first thing that we have to think about is, you know, what is it that we're, we're trying to do? So again, the first thing that I would do um, when we're setting up is I'd set up the kind of structure. So what do I want the structure to be like? So I always, always start with structure. That's the thing that you want to define first. So, you know, we need an instruction screen. We need um, the levels of our end back task. And I'm going to go into this in a second. Uh, we need our level one, two, and three instructions. We need some kind of debrief or finishing screen. And we also, of course, want a rest, basically, because if people are going to be doing long tasks that might take 20, 30, 40 minutes, you might want to give them a break. Now, because we're the person in question was asking for kind of pseudo randomizing each of these within the the levels basically as well as um kind of moving between the blocks um you can't just rely on a spreadsheet because we could have all the ones on the spreadsheet and then kind of just move up and down using like go to row or go to section or, or whatever but that can get messy very quickly and it can get really cumbersome and difficult to to understand so i thought the best thing to do would be just to put this all together in one script um but it is a fairly kind of complicated script so that's why i'm kind of going to work through and spend, you know, 30, 40 minutes just on this um, to kind of explain this. So the first thing that I did was set up the structure. So we set up instructions. So, you know, I always just use placeholders in my examples. I can't be bothered to write full instructions out. Then we set up the kind of different levels. So in this case, the person wanted to show stimuli for 500 seconds. And if they pressed space, if it was correct, based on whether or not a target was present, then they wanted it to be recorded as correct. And then they wanted an interstimulus interval. Now you can have an interstimulus interval presented in a number of ways, but the easiest one for our script and kind of our logic I always find is just to have it on a separate screen. So that way you can do other stuff if you need to in your screen and your script, basically. So you could use this as a bit of a cop out to use it for calculations or anything like that. If you need to do something for the second uh, kind of screen or the first screen, I should say. So in this case, we just set up for each of the levels. It's really simple. I just copied the layout. For each of the levels, we have a bit of text that's presented. We have a time limit for 500 milliseconds, and we have the opportunity to press space if people want to. Now, usually with an end back task, people will ask for like a set order. So they'll say like, this is 
the target, this is the correct response. In this case, the person wanted to randomize the targets and non-targets. So how could we take this and how could we randomize it? Well, the first thing is, of course, we put <laughs> randomized trials in. So, so this is this is just basically already you know doing the randomization, um, but because there's no like stimuli or anything like that to present, this is kind of useless from Gorilla's perspective. This doesn't really do anything for Gorilla's infrastructure. This is more for us to be able to check against this column because I use this as a way for this. This is a cheap way for me to check for blocks, basically. So this will tell us, because um, when we access row.randomized trials, if it's equal to this value, I know we're in level one, basically. If I access row.randomized trials and we're here, I know we're in level two. So it's a way to kind of just check and access data. So that's mostly why I've done it. Um, the person in question wanted uh, to run level one two times. So you can see I've put that in there here. Then they wanted to run level two. And then from level two, they wanted it to be adaptive so that if you scored a certain amount, you moved up. If you scored a certain amount, you stayed the same. And if you scored a lower amount, you moved down. Um, and in this case, I've only done three levels, but you can do this to ad nauseum. You know, you could do, you could do a 40 n back task if you wanted to torture participants. Um, but obviously remember working memory limits don't go that far in psychology. So, you know, even like a four or five and back task is quite difficult when you get to six or seven due to the limits of working, me <laughs> working memory, you're going to be really, really suffering as a participant. So we've got our way of identifying our blocks. Um, we've got our levels that we refer to. We've got our instructions. Uh, remember these have row numbers as well. So this is what we're going to be using to access them basically. So we're going to send in the script. We're going to be using the script to send us back to, um, back to this kind of row. Now you'll notice in level one, I put the instructions and then I put the first one, which isn't randomized. Uh, and then I've put the first two in level two that are not randomized and the first three in level three that are not randomized. So the reason I've done that is because these are um, practice trials, basically. Uh, practice trials are the end trials. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. So these are the end trials where you can't have, um, you know, kind of any end back kind of response. So in some cases, some people want end backs where, like, for example, say this has a response, which is level three. So three uh, letters ago, they want to be able to go back to into this this grouping as well. So some people do that where they do um, end backs, but over um, kind of different sets of stimuli. So that that is that has been done. Um, so that's one way to do it. Some people just want uh, kind of isolated blocks. So that, for example, obviously in the first um, level here, you can then go back three because there's no three stimuli to go back to. Uh, there's no three stimuli to go back to here because this is just your second one. And in the third one, of course, then's the first time you can have your first kind of target. But in this case, we've got three levels of stimuli uh, where we basically aren't, just aren't going to be using it for um, uh, targets or for non-target trials. These are like the setup trials, basically, that we run first. Now, the reason I haven't put randomized trials in here is even if I put them in, it wouldn't really make a difference because we could randomize them and know they're in this kind of block three. But because I don't have randomized trials here, I've created myself a conditional that I can check against. So if I check this row and I check both columns and I see there's nothing in here, but this says level three, I know that we're in the end trials of level three, not in the experimental trials. So that way, like I'm already creating logical kind of statements that I can check against. So I know that if I check in, there's something in this column and we're in level three, I know we're in experimental mode, basically. So that's what this spreadsheet is mostly for, is just to set up the logic for our script. Um, structure is uh you know set up so we've got like a rest page and everything the what i've done for the instructions just for this example so you can have them timed you don't have to have them like i do i have the instructions and i've got the kind of continue buttons there so people kind of have to go on to the to the next zone if you wanted to time these instead and you wanted to time the rest you could change that there's nothing nothing stopping you now in the spreadsheet if i scroll all the way down you'll notice that I've also included the rest and the debrief here. Now you might think, okay, well, if we're going all the way through this, you know, are we going to hit the rest and debrief ones anyway? Well, no, because the entire logic for controlling the spreadsheet beyond level two is going to be our script essentially. So our script is going to control um, where we go. So we're just, we're not going to hit this naturally. We're going to hit this using our script. 
So how do we get from here to obviously where the script is? Well, I'm just gonna kind of take you through it. Um, but first I wanna show you what it looks like. So if I just press preview task, so we'll just start here. I'm gonna put the console on. And the reason I'm putting the console on is because it logs everything. So let's put preserved log on and then I press next. So this is our level one instruction. So remember the person wanted two level one blocks and one level two block and then it to be adaptive. So you press that. So I put a bit of logging in here that tells me what's going on. So I can see that as it's presenting letters, it's giving me the trial counter. It's telling me that the trial counter was reset at the beginning of the block. And then it's moving on from there. So it was given a second to reach 20 trials. So we've reached 20 trials. Now this is our next block and the next block is going to be block two because I've got that to console log to me and I'll show you how that works in a second. Let's reset the trial counter. It's going to do, uh, it's going to do 20 trials again. And then remember the person wanted it to be adaptive from the third block. So from the third block, we need to know what the person's score is to know where to send them basically. So because this is running, um, kind of automatically, uh, me timing out, so me not pressing a response should count as correct on 14 out of the 20 trials because there's going to be six targets and 14 non-targets. So six times I should be pressing space, 14 times I should not be pressing space. And in this case, because I'm just letting it run automatically, I should be getting a solid 70% correct per block because I should be hitting those 14 out of 20. Um, basically, and you'll see that in a second. So if I press run now, you'll see it says trial counter reset twice. That's because I just reset it when the screen is presented with the end trial. So I make sure that it's cleared twice. Um, you don't have to, you could just do it once. Um, but I just did it for, for ease of use when I was scripting. So now it's logging. And at the end of the third trial, we have percentage correct, 70%. It says time to calculate next level. We should go to row 24. Row 24 is the start of block uh, or level one, I should say. And then next block is four. And then I press run and it just does the same thing. Kind of add, ad nauseum basically, but forever. Um, so that's logged everything here in the side. So, you know, as, as it's gone through, it's logged all of these statements for me. Now, how did I get it to kind of log all this? Well, in my kind of uh, more complex kind of script, um, what I've done is I've added in, and I'll show you how this all works in a second. I've added in all of these statements to make sure it's logging to the console so I can see what it's doing. So in my very advanced kind of <laughs> logic where we've got a bunch of his statements after each other, uh, what I wanted to do is make sure that we're doing the correct things and that we're kind of looking at the correct sections. So I've added a bunch of console logs to kind of keep track of where we are and what variables to to look at. Um, obviously, Gorilla's rendering this as a, a website for us. So it's rendering this as web data for us. So console logs are kind of one of the easiest ways if you're new to access the kind of um, what's going on in your experiment in the back end, basically. So for example, in my um, when I reset the trials during those kind of end trials in the end back one, I do a console log saying trial counter reset, and that's because I put trial counter equal to zero because I don't want trial counter to start counting until we hit those experimental trials. So that's just one example. Um, another one is this next block one. So um, when I'm in the on-screen finish hook, and I'll, I'll show you this in more broken down detail in a second, I, I say, you know, next block's coming up, and the next block is whatever the block counter is being set to. So that way, like I can see that, you know, the next block was two, the next block was three, the next block was four, and I can see like the percentage correct. The percentage correct I did a bit further down. So that was done in my is correct, uh, sorry, on screen redirect hook basically to calculate the percentage correct of each block. So let's kind of break down how we got there, what it's doing, you know, how we got from, from zero to a hundred basically. Um, let me just, Refresh this. There we go. So um, I always put uh, a whole bunch of comments just to help people out who are using it. But the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to set up um, a bunch of global variables that we can reference kind of going around and round in each iteration. 
for our targets. So in an MBAC task, we want to know what the target was X number of letters ago. Now, you could just set up one set of these, so you wouldn't have to make like back one minus one, back two minus two. You could just make like back minus one, back minus two, back minus three, back minus four. But for the person who was uh, using this and for other people who are using it, I think it's nicer to do it this way because then they know what block it relates to, but you could just do like back one, back two, back three, basically. So in this case, I've just set them up. So when you make a variable, when you use the var keyword, um, you can initialize it with a value. In this case, I'm just initializing it as empty because there's no no target letter. So that's kind of the setup of all the targets that we need. So for the end back one, there's um, back one minus one. For the end back two, there's back one minus one, back one minus two, and so on and so forth. So the first thing is, is the letters that the person was going to be using as stimuli. So they sent me some of the letters that they were going to be using, but does you could you could use anything. You could use, um, for example, images. There's nothing stopping you from making like uh, an array of images using your gorilla stimuli, for example, or letters, or uh, you know whatever you wanted to measure in terms of like um, you know n back stimuli. In this case, they were wanting letters. So what this is creating here is it's creating something known as an array. So an array is just like a group of elements. In this case, it's a group of string elements. So depending on the language you are using, you can usually, uh, arrays usually have to be one type of data. So you, depending on what language you're using, you might not be able to like mix numerical data and like um, string data, for example. Uh, in Python, you can, for example, so Python is something known as a tuple. In a tuple, you can mix data types. In this case, um, so with JavaScript, it's, it's like so the, the the official programming term for it is data typing. So whether it's like strict data typing um, for arrays. So in this case, you know, we're just using string data. We've just got letters. So the person's using letters as stimuli. So this is just a variable that exists within our script called letters. It doesn't get automatically presented on screen or anything. It's literally just a grouping of the letter stimuli that's being used. Next, I set up a block counter because I wanted to keep track of how many blocks were on. So the person that had requested this was asking for after the third block or during the third block to collect, uh, obviously, your responses and then to make sure that, you know, we adapt the difficulty to how well or how bad the participant's doing. So we need some way of knowing what block we're in as well. Um, now, the thing is with the spreadsheet, we can use randomized trials to check what level we're on, sure. But it's kind of hard to tell what block you're on because if you're going up and down this, how do you know if this is the sixth or seventh time you've seen level one? So that's why I added a block counter. Next, I added another array, and this array is called trial order. So trial order is basically, you know, how we're going to define targets and non-targets. So I put six targets in that I've just called trial and then um, 14 non-trials. This is basically just a selection array. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this array to pick whether something should be a target or non-target, and then we're going to pick a target or non-target from this other letter array. Now, you could have two different arrays if you wanted to. You could have a target and non-target array. Of course, you're going to make the scripting more complicated then, because if you're picking a target trial, you need to know what letter was X whatever ago. So you then might need to repick from, from a different array or something. So in this case, it's easy because it's just one, one set of stimuli that we're picking from. Sometimes then back, um, one task can use multiple stimuli. Then I did a trial order per level. So trial order here is an array with 20 elements. So, you know, if we did trial order and we looked at the zero of elements, so the first element, we'd get at the moment, we'd get trial. If we looked at the first element, we'd get trial. If we looked at the fifth element, we'd get trial, uh, which is here. If we looked at the sixth element, it would be non-trial because um, this isn't randomized at all. Now, the thing is, if I was going to reuse this over and over and over again, I could just shuffle it multiple times. Uh, just using this, but I want to have like an order per level. So one of the things I don't have time to do because I don't get enough time for this is to go back and like refactor code. So when you make code, usually you go back and you check and you see like where you can make things faster and use less stuff to use less lines to make things less prone to error because the less code you're using to do something, generally the better it is because, you know, then you get less chance for error, less chance for something screwing up basically. So I could have just reused this and shuffled this each time 
Um, but when I first wrote this, what I was going to do was pick elements and remove them from these after being shuffled um, rather than just um, kind of reshuffling them. And that's kind of what I went with. Uh, that way, that way, I know that we're not going to get like a replacement. So if I shuffled them and then I reshuffled them in something like that, and I didn't apply any kind of further selection logic. What would happen is I could get like twelve trials, for example, and that's not what the person wanted. They wanted six targets. So the idea that I had first of all, which is the, what's made it into the final script, is what I'm talking about, is from this list of twenty, I shuffle and then I pick, and then basically we remove from there. So because I wanted one per um, level, I've got trial one order, trial two order, um, and these are kind of set up to be, be copies of this. Then we've got our current trial type. So uh, I set this up to hold to know whether or not we've picked a trial or we've picked a non-trial. Uh, I then set up something to tell us what the last level was, something to tell us what the current level is, what the next level should be what row we should go to. So these are all things that I'm thinking about that I'm going to need to compare logically to be able to, to know what's going on. Uh, I then set up a variable for current letter. So we need something to present on screen. So we need to know what to tell Gorilla to present. Um, then I've got a trial counter that keeps track of the trials and the blocks, the thing that we reset. And then I've put this bit here about number of blocks so people can just change that. So Gorilla will know how many blocks you're, well, the script will know, not Gorilla. The script will know how many you're uh, intending to do. And there's a rest after, and in this case, this is a singular rest after eight blocks. So uh, what I'm doing later on the script, and I'll show you, is when we reach the end of the eighth block, I'm telling it to take a rest so that it kind of stops, basically. Uh, then I've set up a couple of variables and these are hard coded and hard code just means like referring to something that exists as is and it's probably because it's not dynamic. So if this changed, if these rows changed, if people added more rows to this, this would then not work. So this is important. So I've put these are absolute based on your spreadsheet should change them as necessary. So in this case, the row that starts block one is 24. So if we go to the spreadsheet here, Row 24 is our instructions, and then obviously the next one is the first end trial, and then it goes into the 20, 20 trials, basically. Um, the next bits I've put are obviously rows to start block two, block three, or level three, I should say, not block. I keep saying block. Uh, <laughs> I, should have, I should have called these levels, not blocks, but yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a mistake. I'll, I'll edit that for the, for the open material so people don't get confused. Because I'm confusing myself. So level three, level two, um, and level one. And then I put the row for the end screen and the row for the rest screen because we're taking control from Gorilla. We don't want Gorilla just to run down the spreadsheet. We want to be able to tell Gorilla where to go, basically. Um, I also then put a percentage correct calculator so we can check that. Uh, correct counter, like I was doing earlier, where we can check the number of correct trials and the font size that's wanted um, because the person wanted to change the font size um, of the letters that are presented. I used, um, just talking about the font size for a second, uh, when you're giving CSS instructions to uh, JavaScript to pass on to the styling, you should always pass them in string because like, if you don't pass them in string, uh, for example, if I put like 50 pixels without string or something, it would just error out. So the CSS is expecting a string value to kind of go through. I used five EM, so EM is a responsive scaling unit. So if, for example, you put 50 pixels and someone has a smaller screen, 50 pixels takes up more of the screen. In this case, 5EM is like a responsive sizing, so a smaller screen will have smaller font size, basically. But there are there are others like REM and other, other values like that. But you can change this by going to 6EM, 7EM, all that kind of stuff. So the first thing I wanted to do was just make sure that I set up and sorted out my trial orders for the first times. Um, and one of the things that I'm just figuring out looking at this is I'm not shuffling them uh, kind of on each level. So actually, I'm going to make a little change to the script that I put on my open materials because I only shuffle the once, but you can shuffle kind of multiple times for each of the levels to come through. So I just realized, and if Samantha's still here, I'll send this, uh, this updated for you. Um, but obviously, because we only display the instructions once, um, the problem here is is that uh, we're only shuffling them once. So actually, we should be shuffling them each time we hit the level. Otherwise, like it's still going to end up with the same order every time you go to level three, basically. Um, so I'm going to change that. But uh, that's the next bit. Yeah, yeah. I just I just realized that, and I've only shuffled them the once. 
So yeah, I'll do that when I'll do that when we hit the first trial when we do the instructions basically for each trial. Um, so I'll sort that out in a moment. Now, uh, what I wanted to do first is um, so I put comments that explain all of this, but the first thing I wanted to do is just take a look at what level we're in. So in the on-screen start, the first thing I wanted to do is what level are we in to decide what to display, right? Because that's the most important thing in these these tasks is what stimuli am I supposed to be displaying right now? Before we even think about target or non-target, like what stimuli am I supposed to be displaying right now? Well, obviously, we're going to need to pick from from that kind of letters, basically. So what I've done is, and I've done this for each level separately. So if in work, because the reason I've done it is obviously because there's different levels for different numbers and things like that. So if we're in level one and we're on the first screen, so I'll just show you again. So first screen is where we present the letter. So if we're on the first screen, what I wanted to do is just shuffle the stimuli. So I didn't forget that. That's good. <laughs> so shuffle the stimuli in each case to, to pick a new new random kind of letter from. All this will do is it'll just take our array and just rearrange it, randomly shuffle it. I believe I haven't checked Gorilla's backend code, and I kind of can to some extent because the shuffle and other API functions are exposed. Um, there's a way, and I'll, I'll show that in a future stream about how we can access like some of Gorilla's kind of uh, kind of more backend stuff that's being served up by the server for the clients. But Gorilla Shuffle, I think, works on a Fisher Yates algorithm, which you don't need to know anything about, but it just means it's a really fancy way of shuffling that's really good for for randomization. You could write your own. There's there's a really like there's a well copied JavaScript example, but you could write your own function and copy it. But there's no reason to because Gorilla already has Shuffle built in for you. So we're just going to call Gorilla, so that's the API, and then we're going to call Shuffle, and then we're going to pass it our letters. So that's just going to mix up the, the letters so we don't get the same letter each time. Now, the first thing I wanted to check is if we're in level one, if we're in screen, the first screen, are we on somewhere where there is uh, an actual value for randomized trials? So I've shown you how you can check if something is equal to something just in the same vein, you can also check if something is not equal to something. And you can do that by doing exclamation mark and equals. So I'm saying if row.randomized trials is not equal to nothing to do something. Now, the reason I did that rather than saying equals one or equals two or equals three or something is so I could copy and paste this if function to save myself trouble, <laughs> basically. So that, that just saves me, saves me time. Um, then what we're gonna do is set the parent type to whatever's in the trial counter base, a uh, trial order, sorry, using the trial counter. So if you remember, the trial counter first starts out at zero. So basically that's like the zeroth element in trial order one. So trial order one is just a copy of our trial order and it's obviously been shuffled. So it's just picking from there, basically. Um, so the trial order one is just a grouping of those trial, non-trial words. And we're just using the trial counter to pick from, from there, basically. Obviously, it's been shuffled, so it's not going to have six trials in a row and then 14 non-trials. But of course, it's only been shuffled the once, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit that code live in a little bit um, when I've done explaining this. So what we've got is we've got this trial order, and we're just picking the trial counter, so the current trial that we're on from that. Now, how do we do that? Well, when you want to access an array, so if I, I'm just going to do, so I'm going to do an array like this. If I use the square brackets, you can access the number that you give in an array in JavaScript. So if I put a zero there, that would give us the first element in the array. If I do, um, if I do, let me just, if I do one, if I do two, if I do three, so on and so forth, that'll give us an array. So what happens is, is as the trial counter is going on, we're accessing each individual element of that array. Now, obviously this is gonna return either the words trial or non-trial for us. And if you remember from up here, it's just lowercase trial, lowercase non-trial, but you could use anything. So in this case, what I want to do is if it's a trial, then we need it to be, I could have called it target on non-target. So I might edit that as well for my open materials to make it a bit easier for people. But if it's a trial, what I wanted to do is I want it to be whatever the letter was, you know, one ago. Because in this case, on level one, I want the target to be the one back. So I just said 
current letter is equal to back one minus one. Now, obviously when I'm writing this, and I'm writing this kind of hierarchically, back one minus one is nothing. So this is nothing equal to nothing here. So this hasn't been set up yet. And I'll show you where we get, where we set the back one minus one. The next thing I wanted to do is obviously just present it. So I looked for using jQuery again, I looked for the letter zone um, and I put dot HTML and then present the current letter. And then I did a bit of CSS to make it larger. So in these task structures, if I click on show zone names, you see I've called them letter zone. So this is the name of the zones. This is what we're looking for. Um, and that's the same throughout all of these because I've just copied it. So that's the thing we're targeting to present the letter into. So this is empty until we tell it what to have inside. So if it's a trial, present the target uh, and make the target bigger um, because of the font size change. If we're not in a target trial, what I just said was basically pick whatever the currently first shuffled element is. Now, what if, what if I accidentally pick a random letter that's a target completely by accident because there's only eight, um, there's only eight letters or something or whatever there is. Um, so what if I pick two W's in a row when it's not supposed to be a target? So that was the first thing that crossed my mind. So, okay, uh, if the current letter is equal to the target, um, basically do another type of conditional called a while loop. So what does the while loop do? And by the way, you probably have to watch this all back. Like if people are watching this, you have to watch this all back because this is all kind of breaking down a very kind of complex script and thinking, but hopefully it's helping people understand a little bit more about kind of like how we're building stuff up. Um, obviously in some of the other examples, I'm building stuff live. In this case, we're working back from, from an already constructed example. Yeah. So what happens if a previous, yeah, Samantha, well, when, I was, when I was thinking that, the first thing I was like, what if we accidentally get the same letter? Yeah, like that's that's the thing, right? Like what if what if, um, what if we end up with the same target? Because yeah, it's only like a one in eight chance, obviously, if we're randomly shuffling. Uh, well, the Fishy Eights alg algorithm is like a very good shuffler, but what if we end up with the same one? So this is a different type of conditional. So in JavaScript, we have the ifs. So the if this is true, do that. So that's one type of conditional. This is true for most object-orientated kind of programming languages like like JavaScript, that's, that's all you need to know. So we have, um, if the current letter is equal to the target, what we want to do is pick a new one. Now, uh, the person who requested this, um, and I shared this with um, Samantha, of course, uh, on the Open Materials and other people who were, who were asking about it on Facebook as well. The person who requested this shared a PsychoPy experiment with me. Now the PsychoPy experiment had this little bit of code in that basically said, if we accidentally pick a target on a non-target trial, just pick it again. Now, the thing is, if you do that, that's great. But what happens if the second time you also pick a target? Like, obviously, the chance is lower to pick two targets in a row um, because obviously, like, you know, if you're presenting something uh, and then you're picking and then you're picking again, like those are kind of cumulative events. So the chance of that happening twice in a row is, is much lower than it happening once, of course. But what happens if you pick two targets in a row and then present obviously because you'd only present the second one but you present the target again to the person and then of course you have the same problem well that's kind of what a while loop eliminates so while loops literally do what they say on the tin so they run while something is true so what i say is while the current letter is equal to the target shuffle and pick again <laughs> so as soon as this is not true as soon as it picks a letter that it wasn't the target Great, we can move on. Um, and then the while loop breaks. Um, so in other languages, these are called do while loops, uh, while, until, you know, there's all sorts, there's all sorts of loops that are very similar in terms of the logic, but this is just another way of like a conditional piece of logic in scripting. So while this is true, do this. Once it's not true, go on with your merry life and carry on the rest of the code. So again, the same thing as above, you know, we want to set the container that we have uh, and the zone to include the letter. And then we want to make sure the font size, of course, is set again. So we want to do that again. Um, you could set this. So rather than uh, if I was going to go back and clean this code up, rather than setting this at this level and having to do this each time, because this is a bit inefficient. Another thing I might do is at the top kind of globally is just add in a bit of scripting that adds it to every single instance that this is going to be presented in and um, because that way you don't have to keep putting in the the font size increase and you save a couple of lines basically
Um, the other thing I wanted to do, so um, with Gorilla and with any kind of good script editor, so this is like, this is kind of like an okay script editor. It's not great. Normally I do this inside something like Visual Studio Code. And the reason I'm going to show you that is because it's a lot, uh, I like the, the syntax highlighting and kind of the more advanced features that you get with something like, like Visual Studio Code. So I'm just going to open up a new file and I'll show you the difference basically, other than of course, just the, just what's going on here. So let me just do, let me just copy this over. So if I copy this over, um, and then if I save this as a JavaScript file, hopefully, hold on, if you'll see, be able to, be able to see this in a second. So I'm going to save as, um, I'm just going to show you the highlighting. So you can pick loads of different languages. Visual Studio Code is like a free uh, code editor that's good to use. Um, let me just call this n back example script.js. So this will highlight, there you go. So this is going to highlight all of this. And it's a bit easier to, to read basically, or at least I find it a little bit, a little bit, um, easier to read. So what I'll do is I'll zoom in as well a little bit to make it, uh, a bit nicer. This code is going to be, cause this is a lot of code. So it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot easier to kind of look at. So the next thing is, let me just make this a bit smaller here. So um, if I go back to, to kind of where I was. So um, in level one on the screen index, after we've shuffled and everything, the first thing we went into, if you remember, the first thing we went into once we were on the correct page is we were in this uh, row dot randomized trials. Now, if I just collapse this, um, and then there's the else statement of what to do if it's not a target. Now, if I collapse this, that's the whole kind of um, if statement together for level one. And I've done the same things for level two and level three. But what I wanted to show you is after this else statement here, um, if I open this back up, so we had the target. So the target is trial. We had the non-target, which is um, this other else statement inside the other one. So this is why it's important that, you know, you keep like, you can collapse these so you can see them a lot easier. That's why I like this. Um, but we've had the target. We've had what happens with the non-target. What do we do if we are in an end trial rather than an experimental trial? Well, that's this bit here. And I'm going to go through that in a second. But the first thing I wanted to do uh, once this was all done was just increment our trial counter. So... I want it to be aware of what number trial we're in. So obviously each time we do one of these experimental trials, whether they're um, whether they're a target or non-target, I wanted to make sure that we do a plus one and this was the most appropriate place to put it. So, you know, I added plus one to it. In this case, I logged it so we could see it. This isn't the one that's available on the open materials one. This was just the one I'm using for the demonstration. So what do we do if it's not a trial? And if it's not a target, well, that only leaves one other thing for us where we have to use scripting because for like the instructions and stuff, we don't need to use scripting because we can just use Gorilla's task builder for that. The end trials are those first trials where we set stuff up. So the first thing I wanted to do is when we're on this end trial is to set the current type to equal to nothing. The reason I'm doing that is, of course, um, because when we're picking from the trial counter, there will be a type that's being picked. It'll be trial or non-trial. So what I wanted to do is make sure that we have something to differentiate our end trials with. So in this case, the current type is going to be set to nothing. Now, the reason I want to do this is I want to understand um, later on the code whether we're in an end trial or whether we're in an experimental trial because then I can know whether to mark something correct or incorrect because on these ones, we don't give a damn, basically. So in Gorilla... If we're just doing like screen indexes and all the stuff I was showing earlier, Gorilla would check if we were, say, in display level one, uh, screen index zero, it would check the end trials. And we don't want it to check the end trials for responses because what if the participant accidentally hit something during those, those presentation trials as well? I didn't want to have to make like a different presentation trial structure for it where we have like level one end trials and blah, 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 and then confuse the, the script even more. So I thought, you know, we're just going to set up something where the trial type is going to be set to nothing. You can obviously set this to end trials or like non-experimental trials or whatever, whatever makes sense to you. And the next thing I wanted to do is um, reshuffle uh, order one. Actually, uh, Samantha, I said, I said earlier that 
the the one I didn't do didn't actually shuffle order one. It did. It did. I totally forgot. I put this in. So it's it's already. I was saying earlier because um, Samantha was uh, was obviously one of the people who wanted to use this. I was saying earlier that I didn't shuffle the order, and I, I do actually shuffle the order um, on these end trials. So it's good. It's good that I didn't forget. So I shuffled at the beginning of the level. I totally forgot about, about this line, um, but it's good that I put the put the randomization in. Um, then I wanted to uh, for these end trials, so the ones that kind of begin the block for us. I wanted to set the trial counter to zero. Um, so I wanted to make sure that obviously when we start our block, it's going to set it to zero. Now, remember a two N back or a three N back will have like two N or three N trials basically at the beginning. So this gets set multiple times. Now this, again, if I was going back and fixing my code, this isn't the most efficient way. I'd probably just want to set this once, not multiple times, but there's nothing wrong with setting it multiple times. It's not going to, it's not going to break the code basically. Um, the next thing I wanted to do, obviously, was pick a random letter to start the end trial with. So we just do the same thing as before. We pick a pick a random letter. In this case, we don't have to worry about if it's a target or not a target because, you know, it, it's it's not going to be a target basically. Um, same thing as before. We present it and then we set it up. Um, and I also wanted to set the correct counter and the level to the thing that we're doing. And I put a little console log statement in to let us know that the the basically it's reset. So um, you know. This is all, all present in here um, and all set up here. Then I wanted to, uh, I'll keep using Visual Studio Code for a bit because it's just it's nice in terms of like the, <laughs> nice in terms of the highlighting and it's a bit bit easier to read and I like I like dark mode um, and I know the, the shortcut's a bit better. Um, so I then did the same thing for level two and I did the same thing, of course, for level three. So that's the kind of three levels all set up, ready to go. Um, ready to rock and roll. So now we've got our presentation. We've handled the random selection. We've looked at, you know, setting up stuff for our checking our targets and all that. How do we actually set those kind of one back, two back, three back minus targets? Well, it comes on the um, screen finish, basically. So uh, on the screen finish hook, so this is another one of those kind of gorilla hooks that happen when a screen is fired. Um, I wanted to look at the row dot display, you know, we wanted to look at level one. So again, we're looking at that row object to make sure we're on our level one. We're checking our first screen because that's when the image is presented. The second screen, so screen index of one would be when we have the interstimulus interval, so when we have the break. So it wouldn't be very useful for us then to check because there's nothing on screen to check against. So obviously for level one, if you think through this logically, so on level one, if I wanted to know what the last letter was, the best logical point to set it up would be at the end after the letter has been presented. So once the letter has been presented, we then save it into that previous value. So this updates every time it's presented when we're in level one. Then on level two, uh, we do the same thing, and on level three we do the same thing. But I'm just going to go into the to the block counter as well. So uh, what I've done is, so for the first screen we're going to save that letter, um, but for the second screen, so for the second screen inside level one, so I'm just going to go back to the task structure just to show you. So when we're on this second screen for the interstimulus interval where there's nothing on screen, what I want to do is if we're on the last trial, so if we're on the twentieth trial. What I want to do is I want to um, make sure that we know that we're going to be moving to a different block, basically. So how do we tell ourselves that we're moving to a different block? Well, we've got this block counter and we're going to add plus one to it. Um, the person who's asking about this wanted to go up to 16 blocks. So obviously, once we reach 16 blocks, we also have to give it a stop code. But in this case, you know, we're just adding plus one each time. Now, on the console log, I've also put this in just so I know that says next block and block counter. I could have put this all one line. It doesn't doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, now on level two, we've done the same thing. But what I've done is at the end of the first screen, I set the currently presented letter back one minus one. Um, I set it to the currently presented letter for back one minus one. So the thing that's currently presented is going to be our previous target. If you think about it, when we move on to the next letter that we're presenting, the current target, of course, is going to be the previous target. But before I do that, I also set back to minus two to back to minus one. Now, why do I do that? Well, 
if we think about it logically, on the first trial, the current letter is going to be the only thing that's presented. So back to minus two, which was initialized to so start it up with a non or start up with as a null value, so it's an empty value, started up with another empty value for back to minus two, back to minus one. They basically, if I send them to each other, that's not going to cause any problems. So at the end of our first trial for the two back task, let's say we present the letter A, back to minus two will be equal to back to minus one. So this will be equal to nothing equal to nothing. So nothing's going to happen there. So that's fine. But the second statement is going to be back to minus one is equal to the letter A, for example. A is not in the stimulus set, I'm just using an example. Then when we do the second trial, let's say that we pick the letter B, then back to minus two will be set to A, because that's the value of back to minus one. And then back to minus one will be set to B. And that way you can kind of keep like a rolling thing. And that's why this has to go before this, because if we did it the other way round, then I'd constantly be just setting back to minus two and back to minus one to the same thing. And then we wouldn't know what two targets ago was. So that's why we set this first, and that's why we set this second. Um, and I explain this this in the code, basically. And I do the same thing for uh, level three. So that's that's levels two and three on screen finish. That's, that's that done. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to collapse these two hooks now, because we've had a look at them. So we've got on screen start, we've got the on screen finish. So that's all set up. There's nothing else uh, here, so you can see it's just empty. So the next thing that we're going to look at is obviously how we score these, right? So how do we know if these responses are correct or not, considering it's random, right? We can't have a column that says this is the correct target. Um, you could write to Gorilla and then retrieve from Gorilla. You could write to embedded data, retrieve embedded data. But all of that is like a lot of work. So <laughs> the next thing to do is to look at whether something is correct or not based on the response that's given. And again, this is just, if you think through it logically, it's just a very logical structure. So um, this is a very simple on or is correct hook. Basically, we're checking if we're in level one, level two, or level three. So remember this this little two um, straight uh, kind of characters here are representative of the logical or. So if we're in level one, level two, or level three, if we're on the first screen, so where the participant can make a response, we want to check if we're on a target. If we're on a target, if they press space. And then we want to return correct is true, and then we want to add one to our correct ground counter. So that way we know that they've got this trial correct. Now you remember I reset the correct counter to zero at the beginning of every level. That's important because otherwise, you know, you'd end up with like 60, 70, 80, 100 correct trials. So you need to be careful. Um, the other thing I was going to show you here is I've included this gorilla.metrics. So this is another gorilla API function. Now, for those who don't know where to find them, let me just really quickly show you. So gorilla has a bunch of functions available that you can call that aren't hooks that you can just call whenever. So like shuffle, store, that kind of stuff. The metric function specifically saves into your spreadsheet. So what this function does is it will save into your spreadsheet um, for the results uh, and what kind of key you're using. So um, when you save into metrics, you can't just, Google doesn't allow you to save into any kind of random column that you may have. You have to save into something that Gorilla knows exists. So they have a list of available keys here, and these are basically columns that you see in your output, and you have to save into them. So in this case, I wanted to save something so the person doing this knows what's happening. So let me, sorry, let me go back to Visual Studio Code. So I saved into the zone type, I just saved target. So the person knows that the target has appeared. And then in this case, whether they got it correct. Now, of course, if they don't press anything else, I haven't, this is one thing I haven't done is I haven't put like an incorrect value for the, for the target here. So that's something that, that I can add because I don't think, yeah, cause that's, that doesn't exist here. So I can add that. So if I wanted to add that and I'll add this in gorilla in a second as well, I could do else. So the reason I can do else is, is because we're in targets, right? And we can ask for it. Um, now this would be the wrong place to do this in, in, in a sense, because if you remember what I was saying, the uh, is correct one isn't run for timeouts. So it doesn't know if something is wrong. So this would not be the best place for this. Um, so I'll show you, I'll show you where a better place is to put it. And we could check for, so if we had else here, this would be if they pressed anything else on their keyboard, but they shouldn't be using anything else. And I don't think Gorilla will register anything else because we've only set up the keyboard listener for space, basically. 
So um, I'll show you where to set up the incorrect ones. This is something that I have actually missed because I've only done the positive for when when the thing is marked as correct. Um, these two uh, keys here, zone type and correct, come from they they do come from from the list of um, available columns, by the way. So uh, we want to return true if this is correct, and we want to return one plus to our correct counter. Now, we don't have anything to like test against incorrect because it's just the timeout response. So we can only do that on screen redirect. So I'm going to add that in a second there. So that's the kind of is correct when they should be responding. Now, we can't test for timeouts here. So on the non-trials where they shouldn't be responding, we can't test on this particular bit. So what can we test for? Well, on screen redirect um, is another hook that's fired. So we've been through start, finish, and is correct. On-screen redirect happens basically every row. So Gorilla uses on-screen redirect to like try and tell it where to go next. Now, the thing about on-screen redirect is, is if you're using something like images uh, and you're redirecting all the time, it might cause delays because Gorilla tries to preload stuff in your look-ahead frame for you. Now, in this case, we're just using letter stimuli that's in an array that we've made, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> this is not going to have a huge effect, but something to keep in mind based on the stimuli that you're using. So this is another hook. Again, it's passed a bunch of stuff that's really important for us, like spreadsheet, row index, screen index, row, so on and so forth. So again, if we're in the non-trial kind of category, what I've done is if we're in level one, two, or three, if we're on the first screen, if we're in non-trial and they haven't responded or they get a response of timeout, then this should be marked as correct. Um, what I also need to do again is set up the opposite of this. So when they press space, if they press it accidentally or whatever, to mark it as incorrect. Because I was trying to add these extra rows into the, the columns to be helpful to the person to identify the data. So I should also add the inverse of these where, where they're marked as, as incorrect, basically. Um, and then obviously, again, we want to add one to our correct counter. I'm not keeping like an incorrect counter because the incorrect we can just get from the number of trials that we have 20 take away the correct counter. So we don't need to keep like a separate incorrect counter. So that's that's fine. So that's where we set up the non-responses for the, the correct non-responses for people aren't supposed to be responding. Now comes the fun bit. And I say fun because this is how we control the moving around the spreadsheet. So if you remember um, on the uh, spreadsheet that we have, Gorilla will normally obviously just go down this list. Now, once we get to the end of our first run of block two, we don't, we're level two, we don't want to let it do its own thing because this is an adaptive task. We want it to go up and down based on what we want it to do. So how can we do that? Well, we have to tell Gorilla, hey, once you reach the end of this, let me take over basically. And that's, that's what we're looking at here. So the first thing I wanted to check for is if we're in the rest kind of display. Now the order of these is, is really important. Um, the reason, the reason all of this is, is really important. I'm going to break it through is because, so I'm just going to collapse this again, because I'll go through this code in a moment. The first thing I wanted to check for was the rest display and the reason because, so this was the first bit of code that I wrote when I was writing this is because if we're on the rest screen, we need to know where to go next. Now the on-screen redirect hook, so this hook that Gorilla has. It has, if I go to, let me just go back. If I go to on-screen redirect, so Gorilla has this hook that can send you to a new row. So there's three things that this on-screen redirect can take as, as like script uh, parameters to script things to send. So if I want to go to a new screen, but in the same display, so uh, if, for example, I wanted to go to, uh, you know, same section, I could use the new screen name. It can also send you to a new row and it can also send you to a new row relatively from where you are now. So you could say plus one to the current row rather than going to a specific row if you had like a backwards and forwards kind of jumping task. Um, in this case, the thing I am really interested in is obviously this new row index because I want to be able to send people to particular rows in my spreadsheet and start running from that because I want to be able to send them to the beginning of the one back, two back task and that kind of stuff. Now, obviously I put in at the very end, the rest and debrief spots as well as these instruction spots. So I want to need to know where they are. 
So obviously, like the first time that uh, level, the first time level one is run is here on row two. The second time it's run is here on row twenty-four. And to save me having to write a script that differentiates these two, um, I obviously just stuck to using twenty-four as the first time we're using this. Um, same here, you know, level two, row forty-six, and so on. Those were the ones, if you remember, that I defined at the top. So at the top, you know, I defined those rows for to know where to send us basically. So the first thing I wrote was this rest function. Now, the thing is, is when you return something for a hook, so when you give a hook a value to bring back, it then stops evaluating. So in this case, once it found this return, it would stop evaluating. So I was like, well, okay, that's important, but uh, there's more important things than, than, than the rest, basically. So I then started to add a bit more into this level one, level two, um, section basically. So, um, what I wanted to do is obviously if they're on the first screen, we only wanted to mark whether or not they were correct or incorrect because there's no like logic to go to the next screen on the first screen because you're not meant to go anywhere. But on the inter stimulus interval, this is why I said it's good to use two screens. We can use this as a way to like use our calculation screen, basically. So on the second screen, what I wanted to do is once we're in block three or higher, but we are less than the total number of blocks, so we're not in the last block, I wanted to do the percentage calculation correct. Now, the first time I did this, I didn't have this trial count to 20 in here. So obviously it evaluated every single trial, which is bad. So I want I only want to figure out what block I'm going on to when I'm at the end of my block. So I added in, of course, these kind of three conditionals. So when we're at the end of our block, when we're at the last trial of our block, I'm sorry, when we're in blocks three or higher, but we're not in the block that's the final block, then run this code. So what I did was calculate the number of percentage correct because the person was asking for uh, over 90%, less than 90%, and then between 71 and 89%. It's really simple. We just did percentage correct, and then we divided by 20 times by 100. That would give us our percentage. Um, in this case, I've also logged those two values, and I logged this bit. This is time to calculate the next value. So remember, the on-screen redirect in Gorilla happens before the screen finishes. So Gorilla tries to figure out what screen to go to before the finish one. So in the case of the finish one, if you remember, the reason I'm pointing this out is in the case of the finish one, you see I add plus one to the block counter, but this happens after after everything else. And it's important because if you think about that last trial, so if you think about trial 20, if I was on block one and I added plus one to the block counter, and then I did all this stuff down here with my code, it might think I'm in a further block than I am. So that's why it's important that on-screen finish happens after on-screen redirect. So you've always got to kind of keep that kind of timeline in your mind of when things happen. And that only comes with using, um, kind of in this case, for Gorilla, it only comes with using these, these hooks kind of frequently and reading the documentation. So uh, in this case, you know, if it's over 90% or equal to 90%, add one to our current level. If it's less than, take one level away. If it's not, just leave the current level as is. Um, now, of course, when you do something really simplistic like this, what happens if we're on block three or level three, sorry, and we add plus one and it tries to look for a block four or level four, sorry, that doesn't actually exist? Well, we can do, we can do a little bit of a reset. So once all this is set, the next thing I set is a minimum and maximum. So we know like what the top and bottom is basically. So now that we know what the top and bottom is, um, we can say like, hey, if it's less than one, make sure it's equal to one. If it's higher than three, make sure it's equal to three. So if it's four or five or whatever by accident, you know, so we set it to these levels. The next bit, and we're almost, don't worry, we're almost at the end of the code. So this is, this is like the whole logic explained in one go. So you can see this uh, on my open materials page. You can kind of work through it yourself as well. But um, the next thing I needed was something called, so we've seen if statements, we've seen while statements. Now here's another one called switch. What switch does is with switch, you supply a value and then it gives you something back. So rather than having 16, 42, 400 if statements, you just give it a value and it gives you something in return. So in this case, if we pass it, and what you do is in brackets, you tell the switch statement, 
what it is you're passing. So we're passing at this next level. If we're saying the next level is one, then we're saying that row to go to should be set to row to start block one. If we're passing it to row to go to should be row to start block two. This way I don't have to like write loads of if statements about defining which uh, row to go to based on what row we're currently in and then having to write like 600 if statements. In this case, we just have got one switch statement which tells row to go to what it needs to go to basically. Then um, I wrote this next bit of code down here. So this was the next thing I wrote. So I, hadn't, I didn't write this if statement then. Um, so this is the next bit I wrote that says return and then the new row index should be set to row to go to. And I don't want it to be relative. I wanted it to be like an absolute value. So I wanted it to say like, if we're going to row 24 to start level one, go to row 24, don't like add plus or minus 24 because Gorilla can do that. So I didn't want that to be relative. So I wanted it to go directly to row 24. Now I thought, okay, but what happens if we're in the final block, right? So what if this is trying to execute and we're in the final block and all this is kind of uh, kind of going a bit screwy and everything's going, you know, um, what happens if we're in there? Well, the next thing we needed was, uh, so if I just collapse this bit here, um, the next thing, uh, sorry, the next thing we needed here is to see um, for the rest so that's that's the next thing that was coming up. So I was like, okay, well, you know, here in this in this this is what I'm going to show you. So in this particular statement, there's no way that obviously we're going to hit the rest. Uh, so we're not going to hit the the last block because we're asking if uh, if we're under the number of blocks. So I was like, okay, so we're safe from you know hitting the last block accidentally and then trying to do something else by moving on and then having endless levels, right? So that's fine. But then the next thing I was like, where do we need to put the rest in? So this person asked to have a rest block. So that her participants can rest to make sure that you know um, they can take a break afterwards. Well, okay, we want this to happen at the end of the the screen. So obviously we're using the on screen redirect. But how do we know when it's time for the rest? Well, we define that rest variable further up, um, and it says you know if we're on currently the rest variable and we're on the final trial of the rest variable. And remember, we're checking this on screen two of the final trial, so um, all these logic bits end up together. Then um, you know send us to the rest screen. So that's cool. So we've got that set up. So we now know um, we can send people to the rest screen and so on and so forth. So that's that's that done. Now, obviously, going back to this, what I was talking about earlier. So once we're on the rest screen, it will then use that row to go to, which was calculated above here, <coughs> which is always being calculated um, to send them. Now, I thought, OK, final thing is, of course, what happens if we hit the last block? Well, if we hit the last block, we then need to go to somewhere that stops the whole thing. And that's our in screen. So that's the whole logic for this task. Now, if you've listened to me drone on for an hour about the end bag task, I, I hope you found that useful. Uh, I'm going to do a couple more examples. So I'm going to stick around. So I'm going to look at the vertical slider and some other things for going for a bit longer on the stream. But that's kind of the main logic for, for this. Now, the only thing, like I said, I need to edit is if this, if they get it incorrect. So that will be on the... the um, that I need to edit, it will be on the on-screen redirect. So I'm going to do that now live. Um, but hopefully that's been useful for people to kind of get their heads around um, scripting in JavaScript, scripting in Gorilla, and how we refer to like parts of the functions and APIs and so on and so forth. So the thing that I missed out from this example is um, marking them as incorrect in that special row that I set up. Um, so what I'm going to do is on the screen finish, uh, on screen is correct, sorry. So on screen correct, um, if it's a non-trial, I'm just going to mark it as incorrect. It's actually really simple because I can just copy this. And I'm going to say if non-trial, but they do press space, I then want to do, so non-target. So let's just put non-target like that. Uh, and then we want to mark it as incorrect. And we don't want to set that to be correct. So that's that will just set up the, the non incorrect one for the person so they can see it in their output. Then the other thing is on the screen redirect, of course, we want the opposite of this. So I put non target like that with a hyphen. Let me just go up and put, let me just, let me just make sure it's consistent. So not target like that. So uh, here on the on screen redirect, of course, if they time out, uh, um, but uh, it's on a target and that should be marked as incorrect as well, of course. So in this case, if we're on, we're on a target, 
Um, we want to remove the correct counter. In this case, we've got the target trial that's being saved and they got it incorrect because they timed out. So obviously if, um, we're on a, if we're on a, I'll just edit the, the comments as well. So they make sense. There we go. So if it's a target trial and they're not supposed to respond, but if they, uh, they are supposed to respond. Okay. They are supposed to respond. I said that to incorrect. And then that's kind of, uh, I'll update that in my open materials one as well. So that's, that's the end back task explained that I've made. Hopefully it's not too crazy and hopefully people have found it useful. Um, people will probably watch this back and have a million questions, but you know, post them in the Facebook group. Um, any questions about it? Go there. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be useful for for a lot of people. A lot of people ask for end back tasks. It's a very common common task, and especially the the adapt the adaptive kind of logic of this will be useful for people making staircase experiments, not just not just for this. Um, I'm going to save this now, so I'm just going to put added incorrect uh, metric save for non targets targets. It's always good to make sure you save something useful in your commit message. So you know what you're doing. I'm just going to look at the vertical slider. So it's probably going to be like, I'm probably going to be on for another half an hour. If people want to stick around. Um, you don't know, you don't have to, if you originally plan to just stay for my two hour stream, then sure. Um, I'm just going to look at something completely different now. So I'm going to change gears from the end back one. Um, and I will edit that off stream for the, um, open materials, but I'm going to look at something completely different. I'm going to look at vertical sliders now. So one of the things that we can do in Gorilla is destroy zones and remake zones with a bunch of other parameters because Gorilla re relies on a load of other libraries in the background to make their zones um, for some of their zones. So for example, like the slider, they use a slider that's made by like an open source slider repo um, and you can do things to, to it like make it vertical. So a long time ago <laughs> in this year that's been going on for 67 years, um, Someone asked me to make a vertical slider. So Gorilla slider, of course, goes horizontally on the screen. It does not go up. So with the vertical slider, the only way to do it really is to destroy the slider and to remake it. So that's that's the only way to kind of do it. So we have this slider here. So I've made, you know, similarly, similar structure again, trial, finish, all this kind of stuff. This was taken from uh, a gorilla example about destroying the slider. So this was this was a dynamically created slider. So I took their example here, so I'm just extending it. So I'm not going to go through everything that they've done, but I'm just going to show you specifically how we created this this vertical slider. This is an example of like how to destroy a gorilla zone and remake it. So gorilla um, use a slider. Let me just find it for you. So gorilla use a slider library. Um, let me just search the code. Yeah, so they use something called a bootstrap slider. So this is this was in their code. So the first thing I looked at was I was like, what does this bootstrap slider do? So it's included in Gorilla. So like the eye tracker, uh, for example, the screen reader zone, like a lot of these may use other parts of Mother there. So bootstrap slider is something that's based on bootstrap three or four. Now, if you've heard me talking about bootstrap before in my previous streams, it's because Gorilla is kind of based on bootstrap. So bootstrap is like a way of like proportioning the screen um, into kind of columns. And, and on, a, on a kind of, uh, if I do this, you can see that there's white space here and there's white space here. If you ever wonder why Gorilla doesn't go full width, is because they're using bootstrap columns to kind of separate out where they're presenting stuff. And that's to help with mobile devices. Now, bootstrap is like a very common kind of backbone boilerplate that sits underneath a lot of websites, basically. Um, so these bits here are like extra columns that are unused in bootstrap, but this is like the central set of columns. So they're using a slider that's open source that's uh, that's got this. Now, I had a quick look and they have um, a bunch of stuff here it doesn't mean anything to, to people unless you know how to, to kind of read code. But one of the things they talk about is all the options that you can give your slider. So the first thing people said to me is, uh, you know, I want a vertical slider. How am I going to get a vertical slider? Well, I was trying to see, like, if I could flip it using CSS. But then I realized, of course, that they're using this open source library, and it actually has an option for vertical. So there's, a, there's an option as a parameter that you can choose where you can set it to vertical or horizontal. So I thought, great, this is going to be really easy. We just set the slider to vertical. Now, the thing about the slider is, um, and they explain this in their comments, 
The slider is one of those zones that kind of struggles with the on-screen start hook. And this is why I'm kind of using it as an example. But sometimes with on-screen start, the on-screen start is fired simultaneously to the zone being created. So you might be going, this is the slider, flip it vertical, but Gorilla doesn't know that the slider exists yet, and it kind of gets loaded in afterwards. And I mentioned this in a previous stream. So what they've done in their example is they've used this set timeout function. So this is another function that's built into JavaScript. And basically this just like lets you do something, but at a delayed point. So in this case, they destroy the slider and they rebuild it, but they do it, if I go all the way down, like one millisecond after after this, this um, on-screen start hook is fired, basically. Now, uh, you can set any time. So if you saw my previous stream, I was using like different times to set images to show. Um, you, can, you can set whatever time you want there, basically. But how do they destroy the zone and how do they rebuild it in their example? Well, the first thing they do, and this all happens in milliseconds. So you like, you don't see this. This happens before it's kind of like visible to the human eye and before it's all set up and ready to run and before it starts timing and everything. So the first thing they do is they set it to hide. So they don't want people to see like the broken slider because when you destroy the zone, a whole bunch of stuff happens on screen that you don't, you don't want to, um, you don't want to see basically. So that's the first thing that they do. And like, you see they use container and slider name here and the slider name is kind of defined up here and you can change it yourself. So you can change the slider name up there. Um, then what they do is they just literally tell it to destroy by using a function called destroy. Now, in this case, this is something that's built into this, this slider. So you can tell it. So there is a method, a function here, if we go, that says destroy. So this is this removes it. Now, the reason this is important is when you create something on Gorilla and when you, when you do anything with anything on Gorilla, you want to be able to get rid of it because if you're not using it any longer, you need to clean it up. Otherwise, it can interfere with and accidentally record like the wrong value for the wrong screen. Participants are people using your platform if you're the people developing Gorilla. So obviously they built their own destroy functions for stuff that they created like their zones. But in this case, they're using the slider and the slider luckily has like a function that's just called destroy. So this is, it's got a bunch of other functions where you can like turn it on or off or stuff like that. Um, but uh, in this case, they just call destroy. So at this point, the slider no longer exists. Now, um, they do set the previous values like the minimum and maximums and blah, 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 and all that. And then they, they store that in uh, from, and they retrieve it from embedded data. So in this case, Gorilla is using embedded data, which I've looked at previously. I'm not going to go into too much today, but they're using embedded data to recall the value that the slider should be. And they're setting up this previous value, the new minimum, the new maximum, and everything else like that. Now, this is the bit where I've added like a bit myself. So they have this slider parameter stuff here. And this basically was just a list of options that you can do. And they didn't have this orientation vertical in. Now, everything else here, like tooltip, the value, the number of steps, the minimum and the maximum, all this you can affect by just literally changing the code. All of these options for the slider, just specifically just for the slider, so not for other zones, are available obviously on this GitHub page. You can see like the things you can set, like the minimum value, the maximum value, and all that kind of stuff. Now, one of the things that people asked me about was, and I'm going to talk about this um, maybe next week probably, is how do we set, uh, yeah. so one of the things that you, know, you can do in Gorilla is you can set a bunch of settings on here that basically set these options up. And you see a lot of these will match with the options. So there's a minimum value, there's a maximum value, hiding the slider, styling the slider, and all that stuff. But there's a couple of things that don't exist in the slider, and you only notice these when you start looking at them. So someone emailed me asking, an undergraduate student emailed me asking, going, hey, I've used your vertical slider. I wanted to require a response, but when I set this on here, it doesn't work with the vertical slider. Well, that's because all of these values are destroyed. So when the slider is made, all of these values are destroyed and we no longer are using them. Now this option require response doesn't exist in the slider because it's not something that um, the slider needs to do. This is something specifically for Gorilla. So next week, I'm going to look at how we can like take stuff before something is destroyed and add it to something when it's recreated. So that's a bit more, bit more advanced. So we'll look at that next week. Um, but in this case, uh, just know that not all of these options will be available and map one to one with like any outside things that they're using. Now, all of these are being saved in the background in the slider. Um, so they are actually all being saved in the background as well. And I'm just going to show you 
a, a little trick. So I'm just going to go out of this. So if I was looking at um, this require function, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we can interrupt kind of Gorilla's backend logic here. Um, so I've got a slider require answer here. So in this one, all I've got, simple slider, I've just ticked require answer. So what happens when you do that, just to show you, so Gorilla's kind of natural thinking for this is if I press next, it says you must give a response to all items. You go, okay, and it highlights it for you. You go, must give a response to all items. If you don't move this, then Gorilla won't let you move on to the next one. But how do we know what code is being run in the background? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna delve into this a bit more later. But we can actually see this using the console. So you know I was talking about writing like um, code directly into here. Well, uh, we can affect the process that Gorilla is using in the background. So in this case, I know that when the pop-up happens, um, what's happening is, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna restart this. So what's happening is, is when I get that pop-up, that's then in JavaScript as an alert. So hold on, make this a bit wider. So this is known as an alert. So this is an alert that Gorilla is giving us for using JavaScript. So what I can do is I can refer to the logic and I'll kind of break this down a bit later, but I can refer to it by going var and I'll give it something new. Um, so I'll call it, uh, let's call it old. Let's call it old for old. So, so it's like the old alert setting. So we can just say equals alert. So in this case, old is equal to the function alert and that's kind of native code in JavaScript. Now, what I can do is I can actually affect the function of alert by literally just rewriting it, because once you set old to equal alert, JavaScript doesn't have a function called alert anymore. So what I can do is I can give a new one, and I can use this as a cheap way to find out what um, Gorilla is doing in the background. There's kind of more advanced thinking here, but what I'm doing is I'm making a function, and what I want it to do is, and I'm writing just the JavaScript live code in here. What I want it to do is I want it to log where the alert is coming from, um, which is just basically uh, an error stack. And then I want it to apply it to the current window so I can tell where it's coming from. So now if I press OK, so that's that's running. So now if I press this, you'll see it's given us the alert, but it's given us this little bit of code here that says error. So it's given us that error trace stack. It says alert, and then it's given us the lines of code in the back where Gorilla's calling this from. Now, if I click on one of these, so if I click on the advanced, for example, it takes me to this kind of mess of code here that's been squashed for in uh, for, for machine readability. If I take off the um, this, we can see it a bit better. So this is the function. So this is all of Gorilla's background code here. So this is everything that goes on behind the scenes that everything is kind of going off. Now, this is the particular level that we're interested in. So I'm just showing you, like, I'll be breaking this down a bit further in future streams about how to look at the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. But it's good to try and sort of wrap your head around. So in this case, um, inside a function, and, you know, you're not going to be able to read this if this is your first time reading JavaScript, but basically inside a function where Gorilla's doing its advancing, um, which is just called advance, um, they're setting up a bunch of stuff and they're looking at if if responses are required by going through all of the zones that are present on the screen. So in this case, if responses are required, it's going to throw an alert. If not, it's then going to go ahead and do all the stuff that uh, it needs to to move on to the next screen. So I know that this is the alert that it's throwing. So this kind of gives me an idea of what's happening in the background. And later on, when I show you other examples, um, like unbinding and binding events and stuff in future streams, um, I'm gonna show you how to kind of disrupt some of this background stuff as well. So you can see, for example, that at the end of a screen running, um, what happens is they stop the stopwatch, they start the next stopwatch, obviously to keep track of the time that it takes to, to kind of do all this as well. Um, uh, and then they go through, they set up all the metrics, you know, so they set up all the metrics, the responses. So these are all those zones that are included that we were talking about, the on-screen redirect. It uploads the passive responses first, then it looks at advancing, then it checks to see if any of the active zones need uh, responses, and then it fills everything out and then uh, unbinds like the keyboard and everything. So it does all this in the background for you, so you don't need to worry about it, but you can kind of look under the hood and kind of start to get a little bit of a sense of what Gorilla is doing. That's a good way to start learning, basically. Now, we can tell that these alert handlers are basically attached to these zones. So these are, if you didn't know anything about JavaScript and we're looking at this and we're like, oh my God, this is gobbledygook. Um, that is absolutely fine. Like that's, that's literally, so a lot of people get kind of very scared by this like code. So I obviously didn't write 
Gorilla's backend code. I didn't write the front end kind of client code. So I know just as much as, as, as someone else who's opening this for the first time in terms of inherent knowledge. But I'm going to like look at this and I'm going to try and break it down into bits that make sense for me. And in a future stream, I'll kind of break all these sections down for you to try and help you to, to kind of understand what's going on. But just know that you can kind of peek under the hood and you can see what's what's going on. And it gives you an idea of what like good kind of well-written kind of code looks like. And you can see, you know, all the things that are being saved, all the kind of tags, everything. So you can you can understand what kind of goes on in the background. And we can kind of interfere with that a little bit as well, because we can stop it from doing all this um, if, if we if we want to. Um, so that's something that we're going to look at later. But in this case, I just want to recreate this slider, of course. I want to make it vertical. So if I go back to my my vertical project. Um, so what I want to do is I want to recreate the slider, but um, people who'd asked me to do this originally asked for uh, icons to be added. So they didn't just want a slider, they wanted like icons at either end of the slider. So that was also something that I had to kind of keep in mind. So I'm gonna just talk a little bit about how I did that. So we got up to the point where the slider was destroyed and we got to the options. So. In terms of the options, um, we know that all this stuff is needed when it's being created. Um, and, uh, you know, all these things are necessary for it to start. But we've also got optional options, so ones that aren't necessary, like orientation. We could just give it vertical. That was great, because that's like, great, job done, right? <laughs> like, there's an, a vertical slider that we can now just stick on. That's it. I'm done. I can put it on open materials. Well, not necessarily, because... Um, after doing this, so the rest of this code is also code from Gorilla's team as well. Um, after this, we, I also have to put the icons in. So the icons I grabbed from, so I put them into stimuli. So I've got a happy face and a sad face in this case. Uh, they are uh, royalty free. They're from Pixabay. So no one has to worry about <laughs> attribution and copyright. Um, but I wanted to load them in so that they're ready for the slider. So I loaded them in using Gorilla's kind of API stimuli course. So that's like something to just bring in code to bring in stuff so that Gorilla's aware of it in the script. So I bought in the top and bottom URL. And I basically set up a hike for them. Uh, I then half the, um, the resolution to make sure that we got like a smaller one so they fit all right um and this one this this i didn't know off the top of my head like i could have just told you all that i wrote this code off the top of my head but i didn't know we needed to make it smaller until we actually presented it basically so i just set it at a particular height and um, level now you notice i gave like numbers here i was talking about passing a string to css and that's kind of what i'm going to get on to here so once the you know, everything's recreated and blah, 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 we wanted to stick the icons in. I was like, well, how do we add the icons in? Well, we could just add them in to the slider by adding them in as elements in HTML. So we could do that. That would be one way of doing it. But that wouldn't be, like, absolutely amazing because um, they could end up, like, blocking the slider. There's all sorts of stuff that could go wrong because Gorilla uses... Um, so I mentioned this previously, but Gorilla has, like, relative positioning for the frame based on like your screen and everything. But then everything in the frame is where you've put it in the zone layout editor, but that's absolute. So we have something where the gorilla expects the zone to be like this. So in the middle of the screen, gorilla's expecting the slide to be like this. We've suddenly just done a, you know, 90 degree kind of turn and gorilla doesn't know that it's gonna be like that, right? So we have to make CSS adjustments for the slider. So how do we do that? Well, um, the way we can do that is by adding in code to Gorilla's kind of style sheet. So CSS is something that just gets loaded in with the HTML. People write it. It designs the way something looks. Now, Gorilla have obviously written CSS for how their website should look, how their zone should look, how they should act on different screens and all that. That's great. But how do we add our own custom thing? Well, um, if you ever want to look at my examples, I've done this a couple of times, but you can add directly into the CSS by just calling the style kind of function and then adding a text element. So I just wanted to add some stuff to handle, you know, like the CSS for, and I'll do like a CSS stream later, um, probably like early next year, about how to like change different things in the CSS. But basically I just played around with where the icons should be, how they should be presented and all that. And I came up with a bunch of CSS rules, which I just stuck in basically. Um, and you can see here that I include the icon resolution and then I put pixels after it, so it gets passed as a string value. So I'll I'll do a CSS stream later, so we don't have to worry too much about it. But basically, like you can add to Gorilla's master sheet later on. You have to remove that 
So I, I've put something that removes that as well. And I've put comments in about it as well, because you don't want it to stay in case you don't want your participants to have these kind of weird icon looking boxes later for other sliders. So obviously you want to remove it as soon as we're done with it. Now, how do we actually add the icons? This is the kind of thing that I was just going to try and get onto. So again, just talk a little bit about jQuery. Once we found and selected our item, we've got two functions that are known as prepend and depend. So when we prepend something, so uh, when we append something and prepend something, so if I find something in HTML using jQuery like this row, for example, if I was going to add something to it at the very end, so if I wanted something to appear at the very end of it, uh, that would be append. And prepend, obviously, pre being before, we'll add it here to the first element. That way, like, we can take elements that we find and we can add stuff to them either, like, a like before or after. So when you find, like, let me, I'll just show you this with the actual, because this, this works a lot better when I demonstrate it. Um... So the slider is here, so you can see we've got the two images. I go on to inspect. What we've done is in the gorilla zone, we've added, um, let me just select the image itself. So yeah, in the gorilla zone, we've added the image first by using prepend, and then we've added the other image. If I scroll down there, slider icon button, we've appended that after the slider. So basically, we just took the slider, and before the slider, we added something, and after the slider, we added something, and of course, I just made sure that it was, you know, centered and that it was small enough to not overlap with the slider because you didn't want to, like, if you had a bigger image, for example, it might sit, like, if you wanted to put something there, it might block the that. So I wanted to make sure that it was off. And like I said, I'll do a CSS stream, but basically, like, you can add elements to stuff that already exists. And you can remove elements as well. You don't just have to add them, you can remove elements. So this way, um, we have this slider, and you can see that, you know, it's swapping the top and bottom around for, for each one. Um, and I just did that in code as well. So that's how you can set up the kind of uh, addition of extra things. And I use that in a couple of examples. So if you look at my open materials page, there's quite a few examples where I do that. Um, but that's kind of just one way to, to kind of destroy something in Gorilla, put some options in and rebuild it. But that was using an external library. In kind of future streams, I'll look at how to destroy like an existing gorilla zone because I had a pre because last week's one I looked at how to clone one. I'll show you how to destroy a gorilla zone and rebuild one as well, um, as well as cloning kind of more advanced cloning in the future. I hope that people have kind of find this useful. You know, we did a couple of really easy uh, kind of examples that we did something that was really complicated with the end back one. Then I just looked at this vertical slider just to do something different at the end to look at how some third party libraries and how we can kind of peek under Gorilla's hood work. Hopefully that's given you all a little bit of, you know, just a bit of a taster. And we'll be breaking this down. This is not like, you know, I'm going to be doing loads and loads of streams on this. I'll be doing loads of streams on Psychopy. I'll do stuff on Python, on R. You know, we're going to, we're going to keep breaking all of these things down. But this is just kind of an example to you of what can be done. Um, and the types of things that we can do, the types of things we can access, what we can know, um, and how we can understand what Gorilla is doing in this case. You can do similar things with Psychopy. You can do similar things with Inquisit as well. Um, to be looking at those in the future. Hopefully you found that interesting. Um, I'm just going to close my close my screen there for a second. So, uh, you know, I know Christmas is coming up. We've had the announcement from, from the government that it's terrible, um, you know, Everyone's like Christmas is cancelled, so I do feel. Uh, obviously, I'm lucky that I live with my fiance, so I have kind of an inbuilt bubble with someone that I can talk to. So I know that some people are in a much kind of worse condition. So one of the things, obviously, is as we're approaching Christmas, I feel very, very sympathetic for people that are obviously on their own or just had to have cancelled their plans. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, you know there's going to be some light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccinations. Hopefully as we go into the new year. But uh, as we head into the new year, I'm going to be planning loads more streams. So, uh, you know, probably going to be stuck inside. So I'm going to be recording more and more content. I'm going to clip a lot of these for YouTube as well. So as we go into the new year, I'm going to like make playlists for CSS, for scripting, for all that kind of stuff to try and like introduce people and break it down. Because obviously these are two, maybe potentially three hour streams as well. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody gets, you know, as much use out of them as possible because I want to help the community become self-reliant so that they don't have to wait for me to answer every single kind of scripting request or send it to the Gorilla support desk who might not have, uh, you know, the capacity to do it.
hopefully you've all found that useful. Um, if you've all been terribly bored, I'm, I'm sorry. I tried to <laughs> make make scripting as, as interesting as possible. Um, so thank you very much for, for tuning in. Uh, I will be doing a stream next week as well. I'll probably not do one on Saturday because obviously everyone's going to be, you know, busy anyway. I'll probably just do a Sunday one next week, but hopefully you've, you've enjoyed that or at least learned something uh, from it. Uh, and if your brain is fried, I sincerely apologize, but uh, hopefully you can go back and, and break it down, you know, and uh, we'll keep, we'll keep doing this, you know, it's, it's just to go through requests as I get them, as well as to do stuff that I'm interested in. So I'm going to look at things like, um, you know, data visualizations in the future. So I'm going to look at how we visualize like big data. I'm going to show a bit of Envivo, for example, about how we can do like coding, but really quickly for qualitative data. So there's loads of stuff that I'm going to kind of break through. So I'm going to try and my point is to try and help people get their research online. So it's not all going to be just scripting or stuff like that. So if you've got students, friends, colleagues, who want to ask questions about um, research methods, let me know. And yeah, happy Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays. And hope you have a good new year. Uh, and hopefully we get vaccinated and we can get back to normal. <laughs> I'll see you all next Sunday if you're going to tune in. Uh, if not, I'll see you new year, basically. Thanks, everybody. Bye. I'll think of a cooler outro at some point. Yeah. Bye.